Live now, okay. So I'm calling this meeting to order and uh, I'm asking uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Bailey to please call the roll. President Nuris. Here. Vice President Holliber. Uh, he's on his way. Trustee Goodman. Here. Trustee Petrides. Here. Trustee Pimentel. Here. Student All Trustee right. Jeanette. Here. Thank Mr. you. President, um, also present are Chancellor Clare, Kenyatta College President Moore, Skyline College President uh, Marino, College of San Mateo Interim President Lopez, and Chief Financial Officer Slater. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll proceed to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please put up the flag. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of, America of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which, which it stands, stands one nation, one under, nation God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, and liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, first item is to discuss the order of the agenda. Uh, staff has asked that agenda item 21. 01 1C, uh, the informational report and update on the contract for the operation of the Cemetery Athletic Club be removed for the agenda at this time to be brought back. Um, are there any other um, items that uh, board members uh, would like uh, in discussing the agenda? All right, then, uh, is there a motion then to uh, accept uh, the uh, change to the agenda? Hello, are you guys out there? So moved. Thank you. Can I have a second? Yeah. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, let me announce uh, that um, no actions were taken in closed session, uh, which we were in just prior to this meeting. Um, this is uh, the point in the agenda now where we have statements uh, from the public on non-agendized items. Uh, if there's anyone that would like to make a statement to the board on an item which is not on the agenda, uh, please uh, signify by raising your hand in the Zoom function. And uh, you will have uh, three minutes uh, to uh, make your comments to the board. And uh, I'll ask... Uh, Mr. Bailey, to let me know how many hands we have out there, if any. Mr. President, you have three speakers at this point. Uh, the first speaker is Frank E. All right. Frank, unmute yourself. You have the floor. I believe, am I unmuted at this point? Yes, go right ahead, welcome. Yes, thank you, uh, Trustee Norris. Um, so I'm a little confused. Um, I, I don't understand why the uh, agenda item has been removed number one, and my understanding from the last special meeting that uh, administration was gonna work on negotiating a contract with Power Wellness to bring back to the board. So can we get more information about what's going on and why there's been no progress? Uh, and further, I would say that, you know, the target was an April 1 deadline. So is that is that being discarded? Because my understanding is this is a time sensitive process and it, it, we need to move fast to get there by April 1. So. Without a contract, nothing can start. And you know, is the intention to delay this further beyond April one? I think you know, for the benefit of those that were expecting to hear something about this, um, we'd appreciate a little bit of an update as to why this has been taken off the agenda and why we're not moving forward. We've got employees that are in limbo that think that maybe they're losing their jobs April one. Uh, the com communication on this has been absolutely abysmal and. Uh, uh, I, I don't understand what's going on. I mean, it would be helpful to us if we could get some, some kind of feedback from the trustees or administration. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, the uh, chancellor to comment at this time. Uh, there, there have been some changes in the situation which have required us to do this. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to report, and this is actually a development that just occurred. Um, we actually were in uh, touch with the representatives from Power Wellness and on our way to the contract negotiation, which we think um, if, if the board, if that's still the board's wish, that's the way we'll go. We have received a formal letter of protest from the other um, vendor and um, we 
really um, at the advice of our council can't um, start contract negotiations until we get direction from the board. It's a, le a potential legal um, matter and, and we would have that direction in closed session. And that really literally just occurred this week. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor. Hopefully that uh, gives you a little bit more information. Uh, we, we have a new situation. We need to discuss that with uh, council for the district and then we'll be able to proceed accordingly. Uh, next to hand, uh, uh, Mr. Bailey. Mr. President, your next speaker is Monica Malamud. All right. Ms. Malamud, you are up. If you go right ahead, we can hear you. Good evening. So I am Monica Malamud and I have been teaching Spanish at Cañada since the year 2000. I am the incoming president of AFT 1493, our faculty union. And I have been a member of the negotiating team uh, for the last eight years. It has been exactly two years since AFT started negotiating for a new contract. So far, we have reached agreements on a number of important items, such as binding arbitration, workload and investigations, as well as agreeing on three essential MOUs. However, now that negotiations has reached the last remaining item to settle the contract, that is compensation, the district team has not agreed to a regular schedule of bargaining sessions and has canceled many of our set dates. In fact, since October 22nd, the district has only met with AFT's negotiators twice, once on December 8th and once on January 8th. We did not meet even once in November. AFT has consistently tried to bring district negotiators to the table, offering multiple dates to schedule meetings, only to hear that they were unavailable, that they could not negotiate because they had not been given necessary authority or direction from the Board of Trustees. As a member of the negotiations team, I spoke at board meeting in December, urging the district negotiations team to meet regularly. The situation has not improved much since then. The district's negotiation team has only met with us once on January 8th. And as soon as that meeting ended, we were told that the next negotiating date would be sometime in February. We are holding January 19th for negotiation session, and we do hope that the district's team will be ready to continue negotiations at that point and to move forward with regular sessions in order to finally settle this contract. More and more of our members are voicing their frustration at how long it has taken to settle this contract. We must have a commitment from the district negotiating team for a regular negotiating schedule. And for that to happen, the board needs to be diligent and systematic about giving proper directions to their team in a timely manner. This needs to be a priority. In order to settle this contract without further delays, we need your commitment. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Mr. President, your next speaker is Sean Parisho. All right, Mr. Parisho. Hi, my name Hello. is Sean Parisho and I am a full-time faculty member of the psychology department at Skyline. I primarily focus on teaching quantitative reasoning and research methods, so I like numbers very much. <laughs> I'm gonna be referencing some of these in a minute here. But that being said, I understand that the more I talk about numbers, the less I tend to get invited to dinner, to dinner parties. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep this as brief and concise as possible. In many ways, the district budget is an objective and empirical measure of its priorities. So to that aim, I would like to very quickly summarize some trends in the budget over the last few years. The data I'm gonna talk about will extend through to the 2019-2020 school year, which is the most recent year that much of this data was available for. 
Starting with good news, the district revenues have increased 83% over the last decade. And this is in part due to our status as basic aid and the stability that provides. And furthermore, the district has consistently underestimated revenues and overestimated expenditures. In 2019, for example, this gap was $36 million. So revenues exceeded expenditures by over actually $36 million. So in short, the state of the SMCCD budget is healthy, especially in comparison to other districts in the state. Now that health is reflected to some degree in the trajectory of our administrative salaries between 2012 and 2019, for example, chancellor and vice chancellor salaries increased by an average of 90%. Um, unfortunately, though, this effect has failed to trickle down. Faculty salaries only increased by an average of 27.5% in comparison over that same period. Additionally, classified and academic administrative salaries ranked first, number one in the Bay 10 between 27 and 2019, while academic part-time salaries ranked between seventh and ninth out of 10 over the same period. And actually it's worth noting that SMCCD administrators were not only first in the Bay 10, but first in, in the entire state of California over that period. So uh, this, the data I have up here on my, on my profile picture is just a very brief snippet that I could fit in, uh, illustrating some of, of that, the, the ranking issue there. Right? Uh, it compares part-time faculty compensation for a three-unit class between SMCCD and other nearby districts, specifically step five, so a master's degree plus 15 is the comparative step there. Uh, and so just this is a very brief amount of time. I tried to streamline the picture, um, but it is important to note that budget and salaries are very complex and nuanced. And these numbers are difficult to do justice to and compare directly part time, full time admin all have very different salary structures. AFT, the, the union would like to address these figures in more detail in a future agenda item. And in closing, briefly, faculty, both full-time and part-time are the contact point between our district and our community. We are the faces that these students see when they come to class every day. However, these figures show that objectively, faculty are not prioritized in a way that reflects the role they play in this district's success and the success of our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mr. Bailey. President, your next speaker is Sam Chung. Yes, Mr. Chung, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I was, I originally joined the, the meeting to, to hear about the uh, upcoming contract proposal for uh, SMAC and I am perplexed a little bit as to why it's been delayed. Um, did you hear I, I the, uh, excuse I, I me, uh, did you hear the chancellor when he explained it to Mr. Elliott? No, no, I know. Um, yes, yes, I did. That, that is the reason why, and we don't- no, I, under, I understand that. That, that, that's, that's part of the question. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to finish, please. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, so, so it's been, I think four weeks, and I, I don't know exactly, uh, from, if memory serves me, uh, I, I believe that the board um, directed uh, the administration to to start talking with power owners. I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of the timing, whether or not um, whether or not the administration has actually started negotiating with power wellness regarding this contract, or they have just been, uh, or or. If they started this negotiation or they contact them, contacted them, uh, in which case they've been working on the contract and then EXO is called to, to challenge them and to protest or really what is, is happening here. Because, um, you know, uh, as, as Frank said earlier, in, uh, everybody's pretty much in the dark and no one's been kind of, um, no one, I mean, not the employees, members or anybody uh, is really clued in on what's been going on aside from the, the journal article, which was a little bit unclear. Uh, so, so I guess my, 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 my question really is, is, is why the, the delay or I, I guess uh, my question is in two parts has, have you guys 
spoken to to power wellness regarding this stuff and why the the and 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 also why hasn't hasn't any of the employees been told what's been going on all they've heard is basically something might happen and and they're you know kind of in in limbo at this point um you know whether or not it's just moving forward or not or you know how this is going to really play out so um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned at, at, at the fact that this seems very opaque uh, from, from my vantage point. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Mr. President, I see no, no further speakers at this time. Okay, so that then concludes the um, section where we hear from uh, the public on non-agendized items. We now are moving to the approval of minutes and uh, we have several set of minutes uh, that we're going to be taking up. I will take them up one at a time and ask if any um, <clears throat> members have anything that they would ask clarify. But first of all, can I have uh, a motion to approve the minutes of February 26, 2020, for purpose of discussion? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. All right. Uh, do uh, any of the board members have any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, then uh, we're, yes. I just yes. have a question. Uh, if, if assuming that uh, as a trustee who wasn't on the board during these minutes that we would not be engaging in any conversation or voting on them. That's correct. Thank you. All right. Okay, so if there isn't a, uh, Anything further on that set of minutes? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Uh, Trustee Petridis, are you abstaining on this as well? Abstain, yes. Thank you. Let the record reflect we have two abstentions and that the uh, minutes are uh, approved as submitted. We're moving to item 2101.2, approval of the minutes of March 5th. 2020, a special closed session meeting. Uh, may I have a motion and a second for approval of minutes? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Just a question, yes. please. Yes. Um, the, um, typically, I think when we approve minutes, we approve minutes without the notations that I'm seeing on this and the next couple of items saying approved and entered into the proceedings of the January 13th, 2020 meeting. Uh, I don't know if that was supposed to be 2021. 2021, yes, I'm okay. sure that. I, I'm not speaking for, I, yes, I'm sure that that was a typographical error. And I'm just curious why we're doing that if we don't do that when we approve minutes. Except I, I, I don't recall seeing it in other approvals. It's just the action, you know, it's just the uh, transcript or the summary of the minute. Vice Chancellor Bailey, you're unmuted. Do you have something to add there? Uh, Mr. President uh, and Trustee Holliver, uh, to your question, um, I, I, in referring to prior minutes, there were notations that were on some of those minutes. Uh, I may have. Um, been an error in, in, in applying that. We can certainly strike that language if you'd prefer. I would prefer to strike it just because I want some um, better understanding of, of it before, before we include it. All right, then uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have the motion and the second uh, subject to the correction, uh, striking that portion of the minutes and also Correcting the date to 2021. So move. Second. Yeah, well, if we second, but if we strike it, then we don't correct it because it's. Oh, that, that was part of the language. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fine. All right. So then that would be the, uh, that would be the motion then to strike it completely. If there aren't any other uh, additions or corrections, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Dane. All right, the ayes have it. The minutes are approved. Um, next one, 21013, approval of minutes of March 11, 2020. 
May I have a motion and a second? And if you're going to make that motion, make it with the corrections then, please. Move, so move. No. Second, Fine. sorry. Okay, with yeah, correction. so move it as corrected to remove that uh, last uh, statement about approved and entered into the proceedings, et cetera. Thank you, and I have a second as well. Any further additions or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the motion is carried and we will move on to the, <coughs> of, um, I think we just did 03, yes. Uh, 210104, which is the minutes of March 17th, 2020. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll move. Thank you. Second. And a second. All right. With Any the same uh, edit. Yes. Yes. As previously discussed. Yes. Any uh, additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Abstained. All right, the motions as carried and the minutes are approved. 2101-5 approval of minutes of March 25th, special closed session meeting. May I have a motion and a second for approval of minutes, please. I move approval with the same uh, edit as in the prior minutes. Second. And I have a second, thank you. Any further additions or corrections? All in favor say aye. 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 Do we have ayes? Aye. Aye. All right, so we have three ayes. Any nays, abstentions? Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. All right, so the minutes are approved. And uh, that catches us up through March 25th on minutes. So we're now moving to 210118. Tom, before we leave this item, may I ask a question? Yes, certainly. We've been working on cleaning up these minutes. For yes. A we just approved the, basically the first quarter's minutes, uh, five items. Four of them were completely non-substantive. Uh, do we have a schedule for when we are going to complete the remainder of 2020? Uh, I believe we're going to discuss uh, the minutes uh, at, uh, also on, as a specific item on this agenda further down. Perhaps we want to take it up at that time. Uh, if, sure, uh, you don't mind. that'd be fine. Thank you. All right, then we'll go to 21011A, which is approval of personnel items. These are changes in assignments, compensation, placement. Move fees. approval. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or comment from board members? All right, we also have uh, Mr. Fuhn here if you have any questions. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that item is approved as well. Uh, 21012A, uh, consideration of options for a College Ridge lease back project, phase two construction at Skyline College. Uh, can I have a motion and a second for purposes of continuing discussions and report? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, Chancellor Clare, you will uh, introduce this report with uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Nunez as well. Uh, please uh, go forward with it. Thank you so much, President Nurse. And I, I want to thank the board. I know that was quite a lengthy um, um, report for you to read through. Uh, we tried our best to summarize where we've been uh, in, on in terms of this project. And I won't rehash that. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Jose and to Chris. I think Chris is here tonight with us as well to, to kind of walk you through it. We're, basically, one of, one of the things I do want to stress, and we were just talking about this earlier this week, is that the, the, the folks that you're, you're working with on this um, and being interacting with, including myself, Jose, Chris, Mitch, this was a project in motion. So we sort of picked it up in motion. And so I, I know there's going to be potentially some questions about estimates and that sort of thing. But we, we, you know, this current team just picked it up from where it was to try to bring it forward. The reason why I wanted to bring this back to board, um, we, we have gone through the RFP process uh, with some highly qualified contractors and we're prepared to recommend a contractor who potentially could get started as early as March uh, of this year. 
but because the, um, as I, as you see in the uh, memo, um, the budget is so much higher than what the initial um, estimate was. I, as chancellor, didn't feel comfortable continuing with this process until we had an opportunity to engage the board and get your direction. And so we've laid out some options for you, but certainly if there are other options or, or directions you'd like us to take, this provides us all kind of an opportunity to discuss this in full so that we um, get clearer, uh, we, we basically get clearer um, direction from the board in terms of what our next step is. So uh, this is really just, a, 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 as I said, an, a, an opportunity for us to kind of quick, quickly hit the pause button, check in with the board, see what you would like to do, and then whatever your direction is, certainly we'll move forward from there. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to turn it over, I guess, to Vice Chancellor Nunez and um, we'll walk you a bit through the report and then certainly um, happy to answer your questions and um, in engaging mm -hmm. with uh, what our next steps ought to be. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just add that the, the report that was submitted is uh, pretty comprehensive. It, it lays out the, the process that we've gone through over the last year, uh, a year and a half. And, and basically I'm here, particularly with my director of capital projects, Chris Strugelfix, to answer any specific question to, to this particular project. I will add that in January of, of 2019, gave an orientation to the board, and I know that two of the board members were not there. And in there, we gave a, a detailed explanation in terms of cost escalation uh, here in, in the Bay Area, just with the commercial projects that we were dealing with. Normally our, our uh, uh, district projects fall on the commercial side of the house. On this particular item here, this is really a, a, a stick construction type project uh, that's been impacted aside from the escalation in general that normally it's about 30 to 40%, but with the fires that has devastated Northern California and this being a stick construction project, it basically has added to the, the, the cost as well as the labor uh, uh, issues associated with this project. And on top of that, that this is normally not a, a a project labor agreement project, but we added that as one of the requirements for this project, which, which makes it uh, 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 challenging, if you will, in terms of what the budget uh, uh, calls for. And with that, Chris and I are basically here to answer any of your questions, sir. Uh, Chris, is there anything you'd like to add at this point? Um, um... No, I think the, the board report is a very good summary of um, things that have transpired over the last uh, year or so. And um, as Jose said, we're here primarily to answer your questions. Um, we're looking for direction to move forward to conclude the RFP process um, or hear other suggestions that the board may have. Yes, uh, Trustee uh, Goodman. Uh, yeah. Trustee uh, yeah, I appreciate the going back a year, but I think we, for me and for some of the other trustees, probably even going back uh, further might be beneficial. And if you could do that, Jose, I think that's that's where my concern begins. Um, this board approved a contract uh, with the firm that is no longer uh, attached to either project, either the, the, the um, faculty housing or workforce housing or the housing that's uh, already being uh, built already over at that site. Um, a part of that agreement was that they would do both. That's how, that's what we went to the city with, the city of San Bruno. And at some point, um, this body or board um, was, um, it was recommended to us by administration to allow that firm to, to basically get, a, get out of that, that, that obligation. And we allowed them, um, how much of, what we're dealing with now could have been alleviated had we not um, allowed them to get out of that obligation to actually build um, this uh, project. Uh, Chris, can you speak to that or Mitch? Um, I don't think I can. I think from my perspective, it'd be purely speculative. Um, Mitch may have more of a inside hand on, on, on that question. Trustee Goodman, I'll, I'll do my best because I, I, I will do as Chris was going to do, and, and it's purely speculative. But you know, based on the conversations that we had had, and you're, you're exactly right in, in, in noting that you know the board did a, a, approve the amendments to uh, you know allow Summerhill uh, not Summer to, Hill. to be the, the the sole bidder here, and that we would go out 
for a competitive bidding process uh, for the sole purpose of trying to get the best you know, bid price for the project. When we were going through that process, as you'll recall too, the board had a, a discussion, I believe it was in April of 2018, um, where we also um, you know, factored in the issue of the board um, was very interested in making sure that this was a PLA project. Uh, and the, the staff has carried out that um, direction uh, in all of our um, um, RFP processes since that point in time. Um, to your question of, you know, if Summerhill still had been involved in this process, we would have had the issue of Summerhill um, would not have agreed, I don't know, for, based on our prior conversations, um, to a PLA project. It wasn't part of the original purchase and sale agreement uh, that we had um, undertaken. So uh, the additional requirement, I think, would have caused us some additional uh, conflict between the two organizations. Uh, again, that's, that's based upon the general conversation we've had after that. Um, and they didn't, they, they haven't been a bidder um, at any point in time in our process. Um, right. And that, that's one of the concerns I think that was brought up then that they would basically use that as an out and that's exactly what they did. And they were able to get out of an obligation that, you know, that they had to actually build. And there was, you know, some, some talk about additional cost um, to our district that we were supposed to actualize with regards to uh, some, some ho housing of dirt and some other things that did not happen. And so, you know, I, I get where we are and I 100% I, I appreciate it, but at the same time, we cannot talk about moving forward without acknowledging, um, you know, how we got here. And, um, you know, I guess my concern now moving forward, obviously we can't go back and change anything, um, but this board did um, allow um, them out of their obligation and um, that shouldn't be lost upon us. Um, we were recommended with the board. Um, there was a recommendation uh, that was made by administration to do so, and the board trusted that recommendation. Um, and now, you know, here we are. Um, I guess my, my next question is um, the lease, lease back, lease, lease back, um, and wondering if that's the best mechanism uh, to move forward with regards to some of the concerns over the years um, that we've had regarding lease, lease back. Um, and, um, you know, some of the, I think there were some memos that were, that were sent out and we had some uh, comments on the board as far as the me best mechanisms. And again, um, having this, you know, brought before us and not really having a lot of time um, to take this in and understand, um, you know, the best uh, delivery uh, process to actually get this project done. Um, Jose, can you talk to lease lease back? Is that you know the best practice? Is that is there something a better mechanism out there that we can use, or if, is this an opportunity to um, see uh, some uh, cost benefits? So uh, a couple of things, and Chris is really the expert to to speak to this. But if you recall, this project went out to bid via the lease lease back uh, uh, procurement methodology back in I want to say April May uh, timeframe, which at the time we only got two bidders. It was way, I think it was uh, 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 several million dollars above our budget. And at that time, the board elected to, uh, upon our recommendation to, to reject all bids and wait the six months or so to see due to COVID-19 and what have you, if the prices would come down. Um, we gave a presentation to the board on uh, the myriad of delivery methods in terms of lease, lease back, design bill, as well as a hard bid uh, uh, notion. And it was, you know, our, our understanding after reviewing the type of project that is that lease lease back was you know the best procurement method and so we used it back in May time frame and of course we went again uh, this time using the lease lease back which by the way back then we had two bidders the numbers came in at 18 million and 19 million and now this time around we got four bidders and the numbers came in between nine, 18 and 19 million so even though we waited six months you know the numbers really didn't change but it sort of validated the price for the project in, in, in the last six months and Chris I don't know if you want to add anything Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the only thing I'd like to clarify is um, when when we went out to bid last spring, actually the bids were sent out about a year ago, right before COVID hit, um, the pricing we received, um, one bid was around 19.5 million and the other bid was 22 million. And we only received two bids. Part of the decision to reject all bids 
um, was to see if we could get more bidders and better pricing by waiting until this fall. <clears throat> and I think we were successful. Um, Jose is correct. The bids we received were between 18.1 and 19.4 million. Um, so the, the pricing has come down. Um, it didn't come down all the way to the budgeted number. We, you know, as a matter of fact, we didn't expect it would because the budget number was so low. Um, we'd actually done a cost estimate back in 2018. And at that time, our cost estimate was um, with um, escalation up through 2020, was putting the price somewhere around 19 and a half million to do the scope of work for the vertical construction and the balance of the landscaping around the apartments. Um, but we wanted to see if we could get a better price. Um, and so um, I think trying to get down to what was available in the budget was really kind of a, we couldn't expect we get all the way down there. There was no way the price would drop, you know, 30 or 40%. Um, and we are seeing pricing come down a little bit, but I think what's still keeping construction pricing high in the Bay Area currently <clears throat> is the same problem that contributes to the escalation of the projects that we've experienced between 2015 and 2020, which really has to do with the labor market. So much of the labor market that serves our projects comes from the Central Valley and it's expensive um, to, to essentially import the workforce. Um, people have to travel, you know, anywhere from one to two hours to get to work and then travel home each day. So there's travel time contractors have to plan for. Some contractors are actually planning to house employees on the peninsula Monday through Thursday. So there's an expense with that. Um, and that's why I don't think we're seeing a significant drop in pricing is so much of our labor force still comes from um, outside of the Bay Area. <clears throat> and then the other thing I think that's really contributed to it is the wildfires we've received in, the, in Northern California over the last you know, three years. Um, if you'll recall a couple years ago, Paradise was actually burned right off the map. Um, and a lot of housing stock was lost in these wildfires. Um, and replacing that housing stock is what's keeping the pricing in this market um, segment, I think, extremely high. <clears throat> that and the Great. fact that raw material is um, just not as available and it's expensive. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess I, two follow-ups and one is, I guess, reg related to the, um, the PLA. Um, the, with our PLA, are we, is it prevailing wage or is it PLA? Um, within that PLA, is there a, um, a mile uh, range that we have? Um, Jose, I don't know if you could speak to that. So all, yeah, all projects, regardless of delivery method uh, with the district, when we put a project out to bid, regardless of the price, you know, they're all considered a prevailing wage. The okay. difference with going forward with a, a project labor agreement is that we're basically mandating that you know all work on the project be done by union labor. And not sure no, that answered your question. No, with no um, deference to um, local hire. No, we don't have uh, any specification to say okay. local hire. Okay, that's I, I was used to you know, at least having thirty mile range or some type of local hire. Okay. Um, the, the, the last thing is the follow up to the, my first, my second question, I guess, regarding the lease, lease back. Um, I was really trying to get at, is that the most, um, cost effective, uh, oppor uh, opportune, uh, way of having us move forward, uh, versus, you know, um, any of the other mechanisms that you brought up? I believe that is the, the appropriate method, but I'll, you know, follow the direction uh, from the board. If you wish, you know, we can reject all bids and just put it back out as a hard bid with the right. project labor requirement. No, yeah, I don't, um, I don't think that. the numbers are going to change, Yeah, but it, it will delay the project. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. If, if you could answer that, I, I mean, obviously we rely on you mm -hmm. and your team as, as professionals. Um, I was just wondering if, that is the case then and it wouldn't change if we went design bid build or anything like that um 
Okay. Uh, Chris, I'll let you chime in, but I personally don't think that, that it will change because, again, we did the, the, the process back in, in spring of last year. The numbers came high. We've done the process again, and you know, we saw a little be benefit as, as what Chris articulated earlier. You know, from my position, I would say, we, you know, we move forward with this particular project because the price is the price. Okay. It was validated in terms of the four proposals that, that we reviewed. Right. Thank Delaying you. it would Thank mean... You, you know, basically a scheduling delay, you know, three yep. months, four months, which, you know, you really don't know where the price of the number is going to come in in that three, four month period. Chris, you want to add to that? No, I think you've pretty well covered that, Jose. Appreciate well, it would seem to me, uh, it would seem to me that we've gone out twice. The numbers are verified. I mean, I'm not a contractor, but uh, having lived in this area and dealt with these things in other venues, prices don't typically go down. Right now, we've okay. had some, uh, some aberrant situations because of what's been going on with our world. But when we get back to a normal world, prices tend to go up rather than go down. And labor is always very expensive here. And the cost of materials are not gonna be any cheaper either. So I think we have a, an excellent project there that we've begun. And I think that we would be remiss in, in, in missing an opportunity to move forward with it at this point, because I think the the bids and the expenses and the costs are validated now, uh, given the fact that we stopped and went back out to bid and have four bidders that came back in this range. And I see that uh, there is uh, an option uh, to use the uh, OPEB fund uh, to make this thing work, uh, which is part of the recommendation down there as one of the options we might want to think about. So- Okay, uh, uh, so, so Trist Tristine Norris, sorry, uh, President Norris, yes, sorry to, to interrupt. The, the, the issue with the funding of the project is, you know, it's really a separate matter. It was put in the board report to sort of enlighten the board that there is a, a nine and a half million dollar issue associated with the project if we elected to go forward. But the delivery method, in our uh, opinion, is the appropriate method, you know, uh, to move forward in terms of the selection of a general contractor to get this project built. The funding- Yes, really and, I, and I appreciate discussion. the fact that we had these two elements together because uh, going forward and saying, yes, we want to go forward with the project without knowing whether or not we can pay right. for it somehow would be foolish. So we needed both pieces of this information to make a, 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 um, an informed decision. So I understand that and I appreciate that. Uh, Trustee Pimentel. Thank you. I just, uh, I have a few questions uh, and, and I appreciate uh, the background on the context. I assume that this is for uh, a goal of creating affordable housing for our staff and faculty. How does this increase in uh, construction cost affect the affordability for our staff and faculty? So Mitch, I don't know if you wanna take that it, on. It, it, won't, it will not uh, increase the cost um, to our faculty and staff who would live in housing. Um, the, if we are, if staff is given approval to, to utilize funds from the OPEB um, trust fund, um, then over time, uh, through rents that are collected from uh, uh, from residents at the at uh, that location, uh, would repay those funds. Um, but we're not we didn't we're not anticipating any increase in in uh, uh, in rental rates uh, beyond what is normally scheduled for those individuals uh, as approved by the housing board. And, and if I can just add, we're really accomplishing two goals. One goal, as uh, you uh, stipulated, Trustee uh, Pimentel, and that is that we're providing affordable housing for our, our staff and faculty. A second uh, uh, goal that's being achievable, and that's in collaboration with the city of San Bruno, that is the permitting authority, that you know we're helping them with their affordable housing uh, uh, requ requirements uh, for the city. So we could have a, we, we have a financial model when this was originally put together that assumed a certain payback period that rents would return the capital back to the, to the district. And then we had a 70, 75% price increase and that won't affect rents at all. It will simply take longer to repay. Okay, I understand that. And, and, uh, and have have the faculty and staff um, who how do they participate in determining what is uh, affordable based on their inputs? Are they part of the process? 
Yeah. Uh, and I'll I'll call upon Trustee Goodman, who is the Vice President of the Housing Board, to also uh, help me answer this question, if you if you might, uh, Trustee Goodman. So, uh, and I'm say, yeah, they, I mean, housing... being on the Housing Board, uh, and they have representation on the Housing Board, so they Great. participate in it. Um, excellent. And then, do we have MBE, DBE, DVBE requirements uh, that are part of the process? Or is there a con is there any any MBE DBE content as part of these bids? I, I'm not understanding the, those acronyms. My apologies, sir. I guess we can't do that anymore. Uh, okay, let me ask a different question. Uh, you said there were four bids. Are we taking the lowest bid? We are not taking the the lowest bid. This is the best is value uh, uh, process. Why are we not taking the lowest bid? I can't discuss that here because you know we're still in, in in the bid process. We would be we will if if we are if we are authorized to proceed with this process, we would come back to the board with our recommendation and and the and reason, an explanation, the technical, and technical there, requirements, points. Yeah, 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 and there's and there's also some board goals um, regarding uh, contractors we you know that we would do business with. So there's. There's it, there's not much of a difference, and I mean there is a difference in the price, but we're not taking the highest, we're not taking the lowest. I, I believe there's a, we believe we think we're going to be in the mid range. Okay, thank we, you. We we yes, uh, Trustee Halber. So uh, a few different things. One, because we're um, exploring background and I think um, I'll give you just a little more background or, or history. I think this actually predates everybody except for me that's on the board. Um, and I fought hard and unsuccessfully uh, years ago to get um, a specific kind of local hire uh, into the contract and modeled on city build in San Francisco and the Cypress Mandela uh, project in uh, Oakland and the East Bay where we would require um, lawfully the use of apprentices in specific census tracts that are identified as um, high poverty census tracts. Um, I'll just simply say our administration thought it was an absolutely horrible idea and convinced the majority of the board uh, to, to not go forward with that. Uh, but we are where we are. And I think Trustee Pimentel raises the question and. It, it, it gets to the relationship between our district and the housing um, board, um, because I think we have been really successful and extremely generous over a number of years in providing very, very, very modest um, rents. I believe 50% uh, or perhaps less than 50% of market rate. And it's wonderful that we do that. Um, however, when our costs go up, it strikes me that it is an occasion to uh, look at that relationship between the costs that we have of construction and operation and what we charge our, um, the residents of those units. Um, we want to be extraordinarily helpful, uh, extraordinarily generous, and at the same time, not live in a fantasy world where reality does not ever connect to what we charge people when our costs go up. Now, I guess that's a conversation for the housing board. Um, I don't know at what point we speak to the housing entity and say, this is going to cost a lot more. And therefore, you've got to come up with a payment schedule. Because all we heard tonight is there's no change in that payment schedule. So I want to at least ask that question. Do we have as a board as a district, any relationship to the payments? Uh, and I, I don't think this is an easy question to um, to pose, it's not an easy thing to say to people, reality intervenes. But when reality intervenes, what can we do? I think, uh, yes, Trustee Goodman. Yeah, I was going to say, I think to uh, Mitch, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey's um, point with regards to the, the, the rents and not 
being affected by this. I think it's in line with us uh, saying across the board, there's a um, intentionality of this district to ensure that our, our faculty and our staff that live within our housing pay a certain rate. And it's, I think it's our vision to, that we're adhering to by saying this. And we're saying, hey, we're, we're gonna find um, the additional monies to complete this project that's separate and apart from the board saying our intention is to keep those rents as low as possible. Um, over the years, um, this our housing board has begun to increase uh, rents and to make them um, a little bit more in line uh, with um, other low income housing or lower income housing. And so that's what we've done. And maybe what needs to happen, I guess, is um, a report from the housing board uh, to this body uh, is, is is long overdue. So maybe that's something we could schedule where we can talk about the work that we've done over the last uh, year or two, where we're trying to um, have um, modest increments of, 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 of rental increases, um, but also understand from this board that we're sending a message to our faculty and staff that they are our employees and this is a benefit to them. And um, they're also our, uh, our tenants and we want to make it very clear that um, they're, they're getting that benefit. It, there's no benefit to um, increasing the uh, pricing them out of the housing market and then possibly pricing them out of um, our region and, and, and forcing them to um, have an increase or kind of disrupt their quality of life. And so it's bad enough with uh, some of our faculty and staff not um, having access to our housing. And that's why we're, um, you know, building up at Skyline and hopefully continue building um, like we've talked about. But I think that's um, obviously a conversation for another day for us to, to really talk about um, what our intentions are as a board and, and sending a clear message to the housing board to make sure that these two bodies are aligned in some way. I think I'm hearing from the board that at this point that uh, we are moving in, in, in a direction to direct staff to uh, complete the RFP process and then bring us a recommendation regarding a contractor select selection so we can move forward with this. Uh, I, I think that's what I'm hearing. Um, and if that is the case, uh, then are we prepared at this point to uh, accept that as uh, our motion and the direction to staff to vote on it? Yes, Trustee Petridis. I wanted to ask a question about the, the financing of the, the gap here. And is that a different conversation about the OPEB fund or is the understanding that if this goes forth in this way, that is what will be used? Uh, I think probably what it is, is that uh, it was just put out there to let us know that there is a way to finance it. But uh, if you would like a little more information on it, then this is an appropriate time for uh, one of the administrators to please give us a, a quick update on what that actually is. Maybe Sorry, I can maybe ask I'm... a few questions and you can they can be answered now or they can be answered later if that's more appropriate. Why does the, why does the chancellor uh, give us a, uh, a reader's digest, okay? And then well, if there's more no. questions, we can get them. <laughs> yeah. But I'd like you to have some answers. And, and I won't be the expert on this. This is one of several options that I think it's a separate issue. And I'm thank you for, for Jose for pointing that out. We believe it's the best option, but I think we need to have a full discussion with the board so you can you can decide. Um, and so if I could turn either, I guess to Bernada Slater, she can talk a little bit about the OPEB just to kind of give you that. What we wanted to do is signal to you that even though we're over budget, we do have financing um, mechanisms yeah. that would help us complete this project. Um, because certainly we don't want to get this thing started and not have the money somewhere. And we do have it. This is just one of several options we think is the best. So I'll turn it over to Renata quickly to kind of go over what the thought is on this particular. Um, Thank you, Chancellor Claire. Uh, uh, trustees, uh, the Board of Trustees members, um, the San Mateo County Community College District has established a fund. It's a revocable fund to account for all the medical benefits for all our retiree, retired staff who qualified for medical benefits. Um, as of um, June 2020, uh, our uh, OPEB liability was 117 million. And 
at this point in December, we currently have a asset value, asset, um, assets value at 148 million, which means that um, we are currently a point in time, because again, this, this actuarial study on the OPEB liability is performed every year. Uh, we are um, exceeding our funding for OPEB liabilities. And while we cannot pull out these dollars uh, because they are restricted for the use for medical benefit for retirees, we can reimburse ourselves for the prior expenses that we already have incurred uh, towards medical benefits and free up simply those dollars uh, for other purposes, such as funding for the uh, college range. Um, and should we need those dollars back um, as the funding for the OPEB increases or, or the need for the OPEB liability to be more funded increase, and then we can, of course, uh, pay back uh, from the rent from the college rate. And I hope that answers the question. I think uh, the, the point is, is that there may be even other options available, but uh, I think it's to give us a certain comfort level that if we do go forward with this project, we will be able to find the funds to pay for it. This being just one particular option we may take up at a different time. Does that uh, answer everyone's questions? Yes, Trustee yeah. Holliber. So uh, if I understand right now, the item before us does not get into how do we pay for it? No, we're simply directing staff to complete the RFP process and to bring a recommendation regarding contractor selection back to the board. Right. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll give you my opinion. I think we're kind of stuck. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that we are stuck, that we should go ahead. Uh, just want to note for the record, I will have a lot of questions about the use of that OPEB fund. I don't want anyone at this point to make an assumption about whether that's a proper use for the fund. I have questions in my mind that need to be answered. I don't have an opinion one way or the other but um, just don't want anyone to walk away from this assuming that issue is settled. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a public comment I understand, uh, Mr. Bailey. Your public comment from Maxine Turner. Ms. Turner. Uh, you need to unmute the Ms. Turner. All right, uh, Ms. Turner, we need to have you unmuted. If she can, someone unmute her, or is that something she needs to do herself? Okay, I got it. There you I'll, go. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Good evening. You have the floor I'm, for three minutes. I'm not going to take three minutes. It was really ah. a question um, that has come up often before with abbreviations used in staff reports that do not give any indication of what the abbreviation stands for. So I think I now understand from your previous discussion, but um, it's important um, to be able to give you any intelligent feedback for people to know what you're actually talking about. So um, I would hope that staff can add that to their staff report templates to make sure that any abbreviations they know are clearly spelled out. And it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Will do. Thank you, that's a very good comment because a lot of times I, I see things and I don't know what they are either. So thank you for sharing that thought, I appreciate it. Understood. All right, any further, um, any further uh, comment from board members? All right, then are we prepared then uh, to uh, vote on this matter? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so the administration has its direction now on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next item is uh, 21013A, and it's an appointment of a board member to uh, the San Mateo County Colleges Foundation Board uh, can I have a motion and a second for uh, approval of the report, please? I moved. Thank you. A second, second. please. Thank you. Uh, I, I understand that there are 
Two board members uh, sit on the board of directors of the foundation. The terms for each of the foundation members is two years. And uh, the notation is that one of the district board seats on the Cemetery Community College Foundation Board will be vacant for the 2021 calendar year. And so the Board of Trustees needs to appoint a board member to fill that vacancy. And uh, can you please uh, tell us who it is? I, I believe it's probably me because I've been serving now for the last two years. Is that correct? <laughs> That, that's correct, and your your term would end uh, next next year, Trustee Nurse. Right. So we, we need we need someone to partner with Trustee Nurse on this particular. What's the uh, obligation if someone could speak to that? Uh, can I ask you? I think uh, I, I've been serving since eighteen, eighteen, nineteen, to the nineteen twenty. So it's been those are two years. So that's why I thought I was the one that was termed out. I think Trustee. Uh, Holliber and I were both placed on that board uh, the uh, year that I came onto this board, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Trustee Holliber? Yes. I also was curious when my term is up because we started, I believe, at the same time. So yes. I would think we'd be finished at the same time. That typically would be the way it would be since they're two year terms. So it seems to me that we would need uh, two board members. Uh, the, the responsibilities are uh, attending the foundation board meetings, which are quarterly, and um, basically overseeing uh, the foundation uh, uh, activities, uh, hearing the reports on the, um, on the uh, fundraising, uh, what goes on with it. Is there anyone here that would like to uh, perhaps speak to it a little bit uh, in more detail that serves on the board, any of the other representatives or the chancellor? Sorry, I'm multitasking here. Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I, I'm not on the board, I'm ex officio, but certainly the college president now has a chance. I've, I've gone to a lot of foundation board meetings over the years. I think it's an important um, position. Um, uh, and for our new trustees, we're gonna be bringing in additional um, committees, uh, I think for filling uh, at the end of this month. And we, I know we, we want to get some information out. I know Trustee Patrice, you had some questions. So we'll get some information about uh, the other boards. The reason why we want to do this one tonight is they have a meeting scheduled for next week on the 19th. So we wanted to make sure there was a seat um, filled. Uh, it's a, I, the, it was one time, I think a monthly meeting. I think and, and it kind of, I was trying to look at the meeting um, schedule. It, I think it's now in every other month. It's every meeting. other month. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's usually from four thirty to six o'clock. Uh, we can't remember it's on the Tuesday afternoon, if I recall. Uh, and really, I think this is a really important time uh, for all of us, and particularly for the board members for the foundation, because I think we have some opportunities really to um, to work with the executive director, um, uh, Takia, who does a wonderful job for us, and. Uh, you know, continue to chart uh, a course for that foundation that directly supports board goals, particularly in providing direct support to students. And uh, you know, it's honestly, uh, although I, although the foundation director reports to the board, she doesn't report to me. We work together really well. We have a standing meeting every month. We keep each other informed. But I would love to work with the board and with the foundation director so we can continue to, to uh, move the foundation maybe in some new directions. Um, certainly they have challenges like every other foundation. Uh, but I think, I think it's, a, it's a, a worthwhile board to serve on. And um, you know, uh, we, we have a big ask in terms of what we need to do to build um, capital um, for this board. So I'll leave it there. All right, uh, it sounds like uh, uh, Trustee Pimentel would be interested in serving on this board. Uh, Trustee Halber, did you have a question or comment? Yes, I do. So I think there may be a little um, uncertainty regarding my term, but um, I would be quite happy to um, hand over to anyone who has an interest uh, the seat that, that I occupy. And it is a very important board. Their work is uh, very supportive of our students and of our district's goals. So we want to see that board and that uh, foundation succeed. Uh, I think one only uh, 
item I would I would uh, mention right now is we are in a slightly awkward position as members of the community college governing board and then members of the foundation governing board whereas we put on our community college hat uh, in effect we are um, uh, making decisions reviewing that board and that foundation not the board but the foundation so for example i think uh, both trustee nurse and i recused ourselves which i believe was the correct thing when the foundation board reviewed staff uh, evaluations because those go from the foundation board to our chancellor to the board of trustees for approval or non-approval whatever the whatever the action may be so um, I just there are just a couple of little nuances like that that I think anyone needs to be aware of where we are in a unique position where we may need to step away uh, on occasion. It's very rare um, in our role since we play two roles. Thank you. Okay. I think um, if if you're willing, if you're willing to, you know, and if it is two years and they both should be up. Um, and John is willing to serve. I'd be willing to serve too if we need to figure something out. Um, I think that would be great. All right. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on this at this point? All right, then uh, I, I think probably then uh, I will uh, call for nominations uh, for appointment uh, of uh, trustees to the uh, San Mateo County Community College Board. Uh, will someone make a, a nomination of Trustee Pimentel and Trustee Goodman? Yes, uh, Trustee Petridis, do I have a second? Second. Any further nominations? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, thank you very much for assuming those responsibilities. I enjoyed the two years uh, working with the staff and the members of the community that are, that are on that board. And I learned a lot about what it does. And I think uh, it'll be a very great opportunity for uh, anyone else that joins it as well to uh, see its function and how it supports our students in district. Thank you for serving. Okay, so we move now to, um, looks to me like um, study session 21.01-2C, uh, review of board minutes policies and um, process. Uh, Chancellor Claire, you want to kick this off for us, please? Sure, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I want to turn it over to Mitch. So, so Trustee Pimentel, thank you so much for your patience. I know you raised this question at the very beginning of the board meeting. Um, and we did want to um, spend just a little bit of time um, talking to the board. Uh, certainly uh, with this new technology, uh, which we will continue, certainly once uh, we're able to actually um, be back together again. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to really rethink our minutes. And, and as I, ironically, as I went through some old minutes, there was a pretty lengthy discussion about this uh, a couple of years back in terms of if we were able to um, get video uh, and a video recording and archive video recording to me, might we think about it a different, more streamlined way of taking a minute. So, I, I'm going to turn it over to Mitch in just a second, and he is going to share with you a prototype, we believe, that we would like to get your comments on. But the reason why we didn't go all the way with the, the minutes, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, is because we want to um, switch to this new method now that we have video. And um, I think it's going to allow us to get caught up and complete much quicker. I was talking to Mitch today and we believe if we're able to go to this new format or, you know, if you have some, some comments and we have to make some tweaks, that's fine. Um, but Mitch tells me that we should be completely caught up, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, by the end of February. And that's a lot of minutes we realize, but we think we can, we can get caught up. And more importantly, I think we have a math, more importantly, I think we now would have a method where we can stay caught up. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mitch, and we, we really want to, we'll, we'll need to make a change potentially in policy to match the new format, um, which we can bring back to you, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Mitch, and I think he has um, a prototype to share with you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, good evening, trustees. Um, you know, uh, staff shares your interest in and concern for um, making sure that we are as transparent as we possibly can be as a district, and that we are um, uh, complying with our own 
rules and policies uh, and general interest in making sure that the public has access to information about the, the activities of this board. Uh, and so uh, we are working diligently to make sure that we uh, do get caught up on the issue of, of minutes. And as the chancellor uh, outlined, uh, it is staff's goal to uh, have um, um, all the minutes through uh, the end, at least the end of June uh, to you at your next meeting, and then the remainder of the year's minutes to you by the end of the, uh, your February business meeting. Um, and um, what I want to do tonight is share with you a recommendation that staff has based upon what the chancellor outlined and the discussion that the board has had over a number of, of, of occasions over the last couple of years about marrying the issue of video uh, with modification to the minutes format. Um, I will tell you that um, we had a unicorn in Jenny Brooks, uh, who for 10 years was phenomenal at preparing uh, minutes uh, for us, but those are not uh, in, in the form that you, you've had them in the past, uh, but that is uh, a labor intensive activity, but just it's simply hours on the clock. Uh, and to prepare a set of minutes, and I can speak to this because I prepared um, the lengthy ones that you had in your packet tonight, uh, it's between 15 and 20 hours of, of listening and re-listening and things like that. The video is, is very helpful now uh, that we have that in place because we're able to go back and, and reference things more quickly. Um, but we recommend tonight to you uh, your consideration for a, a modified version of that, integrating um, the, the video components to the, the minutes themselves um, and uh, we also, uh, and I'll call upon uh, my colleague, Delman Graywall, our chief technology officer, to also, as we talk through some technology options that we are, are now available to us, that we want to integrate with uh, the minutes as well, where we will allow the video um, recordings of your minutes, of your meetings, to also be searchable. And we can attach uh, certain elements of your board agenda with those videos as well, so you can make them more uh, interactive, more user friendly. Uh, for members of the public. So I'm going to do a screen share. I'm going to turn my camera off and do a screen share um, so that I can show you sort of what we're recommending. And then I want to get your feedback uh, on this as well. So let me find, I have too many screens open here. So um, everyone able to see my screen? Yes, we have yes. the agenda. Yeah, so this is, this is a, I, I just picked a, a uh, your shortest board meeting um, over the, the last little bit. And this was from April 22nd. Uh, it was a, about a two, two and a half hour meeting uh, to try to quickly summarize uh, these activities. So again, um, we would embed a link to the video of the meeting in the minutes themselves so that the individual um, who wants to access those has access to the, the video coverage there as well. Um, you'll notice a formatting change here where we will start putting timestamps on in individual section. Um, so if you wanted to know, you know um, where the report out of closed session activities was, you'd see that it was a minute and 43 seconds of the meeting. And you'll see that you know, transpiring throughout. Um, with that, the goal is to, um, to try to do a brief summary of the activities within each section, but not to do as lengthy of, a, uh, of an explanation of the activities that transpired there. Again, trying to get to a summary component. Um, you'll see um, in this first section here, just feel that I'm going based upon the agenda of that meeting and the activities that happened. Um, you know, the minutes need to clearly capture um, act, the actions of the board. And so we wanna make sure that those are very clear and clean. So, you know, we're, we're recommending this format, um, but also there were some, there was some, some substantive discussion. So again, a summary, uh, not a, a lengthy one, but you know, a, a enough to give you an idea of what happened. And if there's further interest in something that the individual could go back and look at that part of the video for the meeting uh, to see uh, in more detail if they have particular interest uh, or questions about those activities. So in essence, that's the format that we're recommending is that we do you know, a summary format with connection to the video that you have for each of your meetings. And I'm happy to stop here and, and uh, take some feedback from the, the board at this point in time. Uh, but I also wanna share with you uh, in a moment um, the, uh, the technology that we have at our disposal now um, where we can you know, have all the videos uploaded and they're searchable and we're able to, um, to uh, connect um, uh, in individuals with being able to, to, great, to ease, more easily access uh, those, um, those meetings that you've had. I have one comment, um, and that is, I, I think it's great that uh, this new format is underway. I like the summary comments. I do wanna make sure that we capture the spirit of, of a point that's made, including a dissenting point uh, so that if, if we end up with a, a, a vote that's 4-1 or 3-2 and something carries, 
the discussion is reflected in the minutes as to why the why the minority might have uh, taken the position that they took. Thanks. Trustee Petridis. Yeah, um, I, actually, I see live captions here on the screen, but we, I think I brought this up before, but we can be live captioning Zoom now as well. And those could be integrated. That makes a very nice transcript by minute as well. And that's really important uh, from an accessibility perspective to have that available to the public. It's also, it could be translated once you have a live caption. So is there also, um, a plan to do that as well. I actually, I, I, I just saw live, I think live captions just came up shortly, uh, a short time ago, I hadn't seen it before. And Trustee Petrie, is your, yes, the, the technology I'm gonna show you in a moment has that functionality uh, where there's a transcript function um, to that. Great. Uh, it has, I think about a 90% accuracy. Uh, mm -hmm. So staff will, of course, you know, we'll, we'll review it to the degree we can to make sure that things are as correct as, you know, as we find them um, on, on review. Uh, and we can make those edits to that transcript, you know, in, in, in real time there as well. So uh, that'll help with the accessibility issue there as well. Let's see, Oliver, did you? Oh, oh yes, sorry, go ahead. I had one no, other please. question. Uh, Continue. Uh, I wanted to ensure too, um, well, or maybe this isn't exactly about the minutes, but related. Uh, like right now, can the general public see all of us or are they just seeing the person who's speaking? Because I think before it was just the person who was speaking and we had a little bit of a conversation about having them be able to see all of the panelists. Is that, how is that set up now? I'm gonna to defer to Alexis. Um, Alexis, yes. how, how, it's, how it's being broadcast now, are the, are the audience members only seeing uh, one speaker the, or are they seeing the entire panel? No, they can see the entire panel. They have on the right uh, corner, there's a view and you can actually go either to gallery view or speaker view. And, and that is uh, dependent on the, on the uh, pound attendees. So they can actually change that view as well. And I'm just curious in the past when these meetings, in the olden days, when these meetings were face-to-face, -face, um, was there, um, did people just come? Did you ever have uh, a list of people who attended meetings? I mean, we, certainly we if, do, they were, we, if they were face-to-face, we, -face, we would see uh, who was there. Um, but like even now as a board member, I can see that there's 62 participants, but I have no idea who they are. But if we were face to face, then I would see them. And I'm just wondering if there's a reason that we um, that we aren't able to do that easily. I guess we can. I don't think we can see the participants. Oh, we can so see in, the participants you can. now. Okay, I didn't. It seems like I tried to do that last time, and I and I couldn't. Is that part of the public record at all, or no? I'm just curious. Uh, we have not included that information uh, in our minutes. Um, uh -huh. uh, we, we can see from the video, I believe. Well, I, I think maybe this is something you need to think about because yep. we are a public officials. We are here at this meeting. If people choose to watch it, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we are going to record their presence there without them acquiescence, acquiescing to that uh, because they're not the board and therefore, you know, we may be infringing on people's uh, rights to privacy. Well, then there may need to be something and this does not have to be discussed now that uh, that if you're a member of the public and you in fact sign up, do they, uh, to come to this meeting that it has to say when you're recording. And I think Zoom can do this now too. When it's recorded, a, a sign comes up and says, do you consent that you're being recorded? Because if they're in fact a participant and showing up in the participant panel there, they are in fact being recorded as having been here. Yes. Uh, yeah. When I these, yeah. I'm sorry. I, if I could make a, a quick comment. Yeah. These are all all great um, observations, uh, and we are late to the party with this. We know that, and I know several trustees have been asking this for this for a long time. And so I think what we, I think the, <laughs> the one of the one of the things we can do with this is certainly go to other municipalities that have been doing this for a long time. What are their policies regarding, um, you know. Uh, video, what are their policies regarding the minutes? And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think we can learn from um, other entities and, and really incorporate that into our revised board policy. If you're, Trustee Petrie, you're asking great, great questions. Yeah, I think for me though, just to add my two cents to that is it's a board meeting. It's not a audience public meeting. It's, this is us as uh, elected officials doing our business in the presence of the public and it's about us, and I don't want that want to even question whether or not we should, um, you know, have them on the screen. Um, if that's not something 
like even if we were having our, our in-person meetings and we were televising them, the camera would be on the board. Um, those that are in the audience are there to be in the audience. I'm, I'm sure they don't, if they, you know, some, if they even want to be on the screen, they may just have a picture up or they may be on their phone just listening um, to make sure that, that we're doing our job. And I think the focus needs to remain uh, on that and make sure that we're doing um, the public's business uh, publicly. And, and may I just respond yes. to that? Yes. Uh, just, and, and my main uh, point there was that I wanted to, because we're recording this and this is video and uh, the participants are, are listed, they might in fact inadvertently be, uh, they are inadvertently being named as being here, right? And so yeah. they need to be able to at least click something that says that they know that that this is a recorded meeting so yeah I, I agree yeah it's a privacy issue that you didn't have to worry about when you were face to face well then you need to go to other municipalities and find out because uh if we were to say that uh if you watch this meeting you have to consent to being identified then we are restricting people from watching this meeting unless they identify themselves so maybe there needs to be a, a third option where they can watch and be watching without being identified. And I'm sure that uh, it's a great point that you're bringing up, nothing we thought of before. I'm sure that other entities have thought of these things or have, are dealing with them. So I would ask the administration to go out and find us the answer to these things. Okay. And we're also seeing in the question and answer that there isn't there, that doesn't appear to be a gallery view option. Alexis, I'll leave that to you, but a couple of people have noted in the Q and A that they only have a speaker view. So just something to look into. Um, let's, let me check on that. I mean, if, if somebody else can send a message, let me see. If you look in the, the Q and A section, there's three people have said that they can only see. Um... Right. Um, this, we always, I mean, in the past we had it as an active view. It's, I, I enabled now the part as the gallery view, which now they, able to see it as well. You mean just, just now you so, did Yeah, that. there's a message at 7.35 from Monica Melmood. Now she said that yep. it's been enabled now. Perfect, thank you. And I just want to comment on uh, Trustee Patrice is that when people would come in, come in and go out of a meeting, you know, it'll be hard to get that consent piece done. Maybe we can just have a general statement at the start of every meeting about the meeting being recorded because people could be on the phone that they may not know and there is no way for them to consent over a phone, that over a telecom. Or if they leave a meeting, come back, join, come back, join. So it'll be hard to get that consent piece every time. But if a general statement is made about meetings being recorded, I think that'll, that should uh, suffice the need. All right, uh, yes, Trustee Halber. Well, uh, first this last discussion, uh, thank you, Trustee uh, Petridis for raising it. Um, I do think it's a really important item that we need to um, uh, get more, um, probably a legal opinion on this because, um, you know, we're in a, I hope a temporary uh, Zoom format and uh, one that I uh, am not a big fan of, to be honest, but it is the world we're in. So let's say in a year we're back to normal and we have meetings that are uh, held in person. Um, what I think is more standard practice, you have a couple of cameras, the cameras are focused on the um, podium, the folks that are you know, on the board, um, a camera focused at the um, podium where an individual gets up to make a presentation, but the audience is not um, all on view, right? They're, they're sitting there, and uh, it is true, you're right to anonymity is not the same in a public forum, forum as it is elsewhere. But um, I think we really should think and learn about respecting the privacy of members of the audience as much as possible. And I know we, we learned um, a few years ago, and I, I didn't know that this was true until we learned it. When someone goes to the mic, you know, back when we were in a live format, we always ask them to state their name for the record. Um, it's good to know who they are and you know whether they're a district resident and so forth. 
but they have the right to say, uh, I'm not telling you, <laughs> you know, they have the absolute right to not identify themselves. So let's be mindful about that. Let's research it and do, do this thing the right way. Um, I do have a couple of comments that are technical. Uh, we just did approve several uh, minutes, but I just want to point out um, when I looked at the minutes that had been already approved, uh, we are missing uh, the minutes of February 8th of 2020. In other words, we approved February 26th, uh, but from my review of prior minutes that are visible on the district website, uh, we don't have February 8th. And we did approve minutes for only the closed sessions that were held in March. Uh, so um, we do not have minutes that reflect the uh, public sessions that occurred on March 11th and March 25th. Um, we do have a audio only um, uh, recording of March 11th of 2020. We have a Zoom recording with audio and video of March 25th. Um, so let's make sure we catch up on all of that. And when I looked at the minutes, you know, it, it was true that on February 26th of 2020, we had a long discussion about this. Uh, it was not our first succession. I feel like we're always, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a Groundhog Day. Um, you know, I think we resolved with with or without a, a formal vote that we want to uh, record live broadcasts and make readily available to uh, anyone um, our, our, our board meetings. So um, uh, I, I think we need to do that. I don't know if that requires a board action at this point, but um, when, and, when and if we do that, then we will need to look at the board policy that we received in our packet and, 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 and correct it or um, change it, uh, update it, because it does speak to things about keeping a record only for um, weeks. Uh, I can't remember, it was a month, for one month. Um, that, that must be changed. I believe we need to rewrite this policy. It refers to the government code. We're not governed by the government code. We're governed by the education code. There are some differences there. So uh, I want us to um, review this policy. And I do believe if we have minutes that are easy to access, I don't believe Zoom as we have it is easy to access um, and is indexed um, where we can go to the particular item and just listen to that item. That would go a long way towards my agreement with this change. And I also agree with Mr. Uh, Trustee Pimentel's comment that um, pro forma alone, uh, where it's simply saying, you know, item, whatever that item is, it was moved, seconded, approved to support the recommended action is not enough, except when these are pro forma, right? When there's debate, there's discussion, dissension, there should be at least a synopsis that takes you then to the video and audio where you can then listen to what was that debate for 10 minutes. So uh, those are my comments, but I, I think it's high time we, 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 we just get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey, uh, is there more you wish to show us at this point? I will in just one second, if I might respond to just to uh, Trustee Holliver's um, uh, suggestions. A absolutely, and, and I'll share with you uh, the draft that I've, that I've put on the screen tonight, that I think it captures just that, and that's the question that Trustee Pimentel had as well, is making sure that, you know, for where there was substantive discussion on a topic that, that is summarized in an accurate way, that gives you enough information that if you have more questions, you can go to the video, but at least uh, it is, uh, you know, um, accurately reflecting the spirit of the conversation that happened. So I think we've, we are, we're on our way to be able to do that. Um, I'm going to call upon Domin Graywall. Domin, I'm going to put up the, I'm going to share a screen here of the Panopto um, application. And if you just want to give a quick, you know, 60 second overview of this technology uh, for the board uh, and its capabilities, that would be helpful. And what I have on my screen here now, we have uploaded in this, and it's not live yet on the website, uh, yeah. but it will be, um, you know, um, probably within the next week. Um, uh, it has all the meeting dates. We're going to reorganize these and make it look prettier and, and more user friendly. But we threw them in there right now just to show you some of the functionality, uh, including, for example, uh, let's, let's, 
let's I'm going to just use the word roll like because we do roll call every meeting. So I'm just going to type in the word roll and it's going to show you every time in every meeting at what time the word roll was used. So you'll be able to search it with that functionality. Uh, with this, we'll also be able to go meeting by meeting using our agendas as an index, uh, as a table of contents. So you can go, to Trustee Holliver, to your point of you know, making sure that you know, if we're on uh, the consent agenda, you can go to the consent agenda, just hear what items were considered uh, and the actions that were taken as it relates to that. So we'll be working to do that uh, with each of these videos as well. So Dominic, anything else you want to add to so that? If you can click on one of the meetings, I just want to show a couple things um, as well. So as a meeting runs, as you can see, um, you can just scroll a little forward. Actually, I'm going to, I'm actually going to go back out of this because I am taking out the word roll because it's only searching for that. Um, Click on any meeting. There we go. That's right. So, so a couple okay, things. So here we are. Uh, hey, Karen. To mute that. <laughs> to mute that, if you click on CC, uh, closed captioning right there. So you can see it'll it'll provide you closed captioning right off the back. Um, there, there's Mitch again. <laughs> and then um, and the other thing I like about this, if you click on um, the um, the speed, so you can click on the speed like one x right now, and you can click on the speed and move it forward by like wherever you want to get to. You can slow down. That's an option. You can even move it up by ten seconds or not. And then even on a certain meeting on the left side on the search um, icon, if you can. Uh, can just show that, Mitch. If you click on any word, let's say um, CSM, for example, or um, if there was any reference of CSM in any of the meetings, you know, you, they would come up um, as a or, or college or president. I think you would uh, say that they would all uh, will be showing, including the times, the times that those words were shown. If you click on any of them, it'll go directly to that meeting, to that point in the meeting where that was showed. And then the other great option we also have is if you want to share a certain section of a meeting with anyone out there, you can just click on the share up on top by the help, Mitch. So you can share, just click on the, uh, yes, click on that. So you can share exact time when a certain word was said, and you can just copy the link and share it with anyone you want to via email. So this is, I would say the next generation of uh, closed captioning, video captioning, and as well as the option to share, review the meetings um, as you wish, and this does not buffer you. This is at a much faster speed, um, not like Dropbox. We had it previously. This is hosted on a very different servers and sites, and this is um, available um, as of this meeting is done. We can have this available once uh, um, approved and viewed by all of you. Uh, however, uh, the voice recognition is uh, is not good necessarily. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, people people can yeah people have to understand that voice recognition can only give you so much that's going to be about, uh, but it does give you the drift, you know, of what was being said. Right. I guess you just go to that place and you can play it and you can hear it. Yeah, you can hear, you can share, um, you can um, you can speed up, increase speed, reduce speed, uh, close captioning is enabled and you can like move up by 10 minutes every time or, or slow down or go back for 10 minutes. Um, so this is this is much better than what we've had previously. Great. Magic of television, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... It, yes, Trustee Pimentel. Uh, thank you. This is great progress. I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, I've heard from some of our commenters, our guest speakers, and as a, a, a recent member of the public who used to chime in at Zoom meetings, it would be very useful to uh, have the option to allow our guests to present their material and or see their image so that we can actually see who is talking to us. Yep. Um, with all due respect to any you know, privacy issues, if you're gonna stand up and talk at a meeting, we should give that guest the respect of being able to look them in the eye and vice versa. Is that something we can do, Damon? Yeah, no, we can. What we could do is we could move them as a panelist for the time they want to talk. I, sorry, uh, I would just, if, it, if the board is okay with this, yep. I would like that to be our, our our default procedure that if we have a guest speaker or a public speaker, we give them the chance to show their face. So yeah, I think that, I thought that was always the case. It was just depending on whether or not they had their video on. Once, no. they're, once they're transferred over, do they not have ability to um, 
be seen. As, as a former member of the of the uh, 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 public, no, I was never okay. able to actually get my face up on the screen. Okay. And I've heard that from other uh, people who like to comment in public. They, yeah, I think that probably this is news to all of us at this point. Yeah. I, I okay, thought it great. was uh, from the opposite side that they didn't have a camera or chose not to show uh, their face. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's very important. I didn't. I never knew that either. Um, and, and John, uh, Trustee Pillow, so you're asking two things. So I just want to be clear. One is what I, what I had mentioned about having being able to see them when they talk if they choose to identify. Um, you know, the second issue is about whether they can share a screen. So I think those are two different considerations. I just want to share sure. a screen. Excuse me. What did you mean by that? Putting things be, up uh, on the because, screen. Because uh, what Trustee Pimentel said is not only to see them when they talk, but if they could share data or something like that, which means that they would have to share a screen to be able to take over. And I think that's another level of. Yes. Concern. And I think you're absolutely right because. I, I don't think really uh, as a board, we're prepared to have someone come in under non-agendized item and then we turn over our meeting to them and the screen without knowing what's gonna be going on it. Uh, that might be more risky than what we would wanna do. And uh, I don't think that uh, we can talk about that unless we think about it a little bit further. I had that request earlier today and I asked that they simply send their material to us in writing uh, so we could see it and they did and it was forwarded to you as part of our packet. So we need to think through that one. Uh, for what it's worth, my preference would be to trust our guests with uh, being able to put up a few slides if they wanna share some data. Um, that would be my preference. I'm happy to talk about it if you guys wanna discuss it more, but pretty good. Well, maybe we don't, uh, I don't know that we're gonna discuss it right now, uh, but uh, we, we could discuss it further if you like. Sure. Um, I, my next question is to following up on Richard's comment. Um, literally, we have been talking about this for a year. May I ask, Mike, has anyone from our staff called five or 10 community colleges to see what their solution is and what their data platform is? Yeah, you know, um, actually, we, um, we actually went to um, other local agencies to come back with some technology recommendations. And the other piece of this that I've, and I've talked to you all before um, a couple of times, that I want to um, implement is something called board docs, which a lot of community colleges are on. That There may be other solutions there as well, uh, but <clears throat> certainly there's other, there, there, certainly we can look at other um, community colleges, look at best practices. I know, I, know we ne I know we need a better platform for just- let, let, I'm sorry, let me interject. I, I don't mean to belabor the point, I don't care what platform we we use. Right. There are millions of city governments and much smaller organizations than ours that have this right. I would ask uh, Mike if you wouldn't mind putting together a timeline with specific dates. Sure. As to when this project's going to be completed. Yeah. I would appreciate that greatly. Yeah. And lastly, uh, to Richard's point on our our board policy. Uh, it is way behind and it reads as if we're trying to actually not communicate to the public or we're trying to hide something. So um, I'm happy to lead a subcommittee if you want to do it. I'm happy to ask the administration to offer a draft at our next meeting as to how to change this board policy to be uh, more transparent, fully transparent with the attitude of um, making sure that the public understands Everything we're doing, our acronyms, our data, uh, our agenda items, et cetera, uh, as well as our minutes. Uh, is that something that you think board members need to get involved with, or can we have the administration take a stab at a updated board policy for uh, our federation? I just want to add, I mean, I was gonna, that was going to be one of my items for us to discuss at our, our retreat um, board policies, but I really think it's board policy, so it should have some involvement from the board. And so I, I agree with uh, John in, in your statement uh, about creating some type of subcommittee. And I think um, having a board subcommittee to look at um, board policies um, is, is definitely uh, timely at this point. Right now we have numerous uh, policies that we do want to look at. So I think that's something that we can consider at a, at a 
at our retreat, hopefully, and we'll discuss getting that on the agenda. Let me ask this, uh, our board policies that we have, uh, many of them are, are things that we just have to have that comply with law. Do right. we uh, get recommended policies from uh, any of the uh, state uh, community college, uh, from the community college uh, uh, office of the state community college board? Because a lot of times that's what I have seen when right. updating board policies, you know, with districts, there are government code, ed code that requires certain language. And so uh, that'd be something we'd probably want to take a look at as well. Yes, Trustee Goodman. Yeah, just before we don't get too far off track, I know we're here to discuss minutes, um, but uh, typically uh, board policies, we you, you usually get recommendations. Um, there's usually a range of, you know, how we want to fall on that uh, policy. And, um, you know, with uh, legal support, um, I think, you know, you would have a board that says, hey, this is where we want to fall. We, with this whole policy that we're, that uh, Trustee Holliver just mentioned, um, we can be as conservative as possible or as liberal as possible, depending on where this board falls and so, and what's presented to us. Um, so the, the board policy that's before, that we currently have is appropriate at, you know, a board has a prerogative to agree with that and that'll be okay. There, it's not against Ed Code to have that policy. But if we choose to be more transparent, we could also do that. And I think that's what we have. And I think um, administration, they have administration regulations that they can present to the board to have approved. But I think when it comes to board policies, the board should have some involvement and say over um, how we land on, on certain policies. Can I, um, thank you very much, Maurice. That's, I agree with you completely. Just to make my point, um, thank you, Mike, for pulling out this board policy on minutes. Uh, I'm gonna read item four from our current board policy. And I quote, minutes and recordings of board meetings shall be available by prior arrangement for inspection by the public during the regular office hours of the district office. If requested, the minutes shall be made available in an appropriate alternative format so as to be accessible to persons with, dis with a disability. How could we possibly have a policy that doesn't put our minutes on the internet? I mean, it, well, it's crazy. Yeah. So Trusty. I'm sorry, I'm just, let me finish, Mike. I'll let you finish, because I We've need We've been to talking about this for a year. <laughs> I'm happy to volunteer to be on the policy writing committee for our minutes, if that's what we need to do to get this fixed. Trustee Pimentel, I agree with you 150%. That's exactly what I've been communicating um, in my weekly communication. See that we and I said it tonight, we can't take this forward without a change in policy, but we needed to have this conversation and naturally the policy will follow. Um, you know, uh, there was a, a period of time from about, I, I don't wanna get too deep into this, but from March to, to May or June, and I've got it in the minutes where we kind of agreed, uh, the board, we all kind of agreed to clear the decks. We had to deal with COVID. And if you recall, we kept those agendas pretty light. So I know there's frustration about, you know, why aren't you moving? It's because we've had to put other priorities up front. But I'm 100% um, clear that, you know, where you all want to go with the minutes and the policy needs to follow that. Um, the other thing I would just chime in with the policy board boards, it's a board policy board members have always approved policy you're the last stop. And, you know, um, there are some policies, certainly this one where it's, it's really critical that you would want to have a voice. Keep in mind, there's a whole participatory governance process as, as well, where other policies are going to come through district shared governance. So there's multiple ways that policy gets to you, but you are the last, you are the approver of board policy. So I'm sorry to push back a little bit, but yeah, we're ready to go. <laughs> we're, we are Thank ready. You. Can I, Mike, can I ask at our next meeting that you provide a timeline as to when we're going to yes. have uh, this updated? Sure. Thank Absolutely. you. Secondly, can I volunteer on behalf of the board? Anybody can join me to be on the subcommittee to change our board policy 1.50 minutes of meetings. I'll take the first draft if you'll, if, if my subcommittee member will read it with me. Well, are you saying basically then you don't want uh, the administration to do its function and provide us with a, a policy for a review? And then you I, can I'm happy to have that, Tom, but Mike just told me it's our job. 
So well, I'm, well, he I'm, said it's our job to ultimately decide what it is. They will present it to us and we can either accept it or reject it or tweak it or whatever. Right. But I don't Mike, think can, that we, we have the ones Mike, that can we have a new right. perfect. Mike, can we have a new draft of policy 1.50 minutes of meetings at our next meeting? Yeah, I think so. Super, thank you. This okay. raises a bigger issue for me, which I'm happy to discuss in the context of this conversation about minutes or in the conversation of our board retreat. First of all, I think we should stop using words like retreat, which infer that we're trying to hide from the public what we're talking about and call it a annual planning session and invite all the public to participate if everybody's okay with that. Um, but I believe that we need to do a more comprehensive review of our board policies and procedures. Mike, I know you're interested in doing that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I put some thoughts into a memo that I shared with uh, the team, uh, I guess last night, and I'd like to propose that we actually put together a subcommittee of the board to do a review of all of our policies and procedures, working with the administration, but where necessary, bringing in some outside experts. Um, somebody made the point about uh, leveraging the, the community college chancellor's office for, for best practices. Um, my sense is that we have some old policies like this one that just need to be updated. And I think we all would like to do that. Um, I'm happy to discuss it at our annual board planning session, open to the public. Um, I'm also happy to discuss it now if you guys want to talk about it. Yeah, I, I think that would be appropriate for that last, our last agenda item to, to discuss it. Since we're talking about the actual minutes, um, we keep going off track. Um, let's focus on the minutes. Um, but with regards to board policy, um, if we are making the uh, suggestion or giving guidance to uh, Chancellor Clare, um, that he presents the board back with a, a, a policy at our next board meeting. That's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But I think what's more appropriate, so we don't fall into um, basically the same situation we did when I mentioned earlier that this board was recommend, may have recommendations to this board by administration to allow uh, a vendor out of a, their obligation. When policies are presented to us, they're just that they're presented to us based on the administration. So I think that's where some involvement has to be um, by the board. So if we do have a subcommittee that they are, if it's you, John, and someone else um, that they're working with uh, administration to make sure that what we want is being reflected and what's being brought back to us so that we don't have to start this process over again. So if there is um, two trustees that would be on this uh, subcommittee that um, Chancellor Clare could work with between now and to that next uh, board meeting that um, Mike will know exactly where he's falling. If, you know, if he needs to work with a policy that's more transparent and more open, that's exactly what we'll get. It won't be administration just you know, throwing darts at the board and saying, hey, hopefully they'll like this. And so um, I don't want us to miss that. I really think that if we're giving direction to um, administration to come back with a policy, that there is uh, some communication with uh, a trustee or two. And it doesn't have to be two trustees, but if it is, that's great. If it's just John, I'm okay with that because I do believe that he um, understands the, 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 the direction of the board. Any other comments? Yes. I would just wanted to know, just as an ex just to take this as a case example. So, um, this board policy that was um, updated in 2009, um, you put it here for us to see. Um, also, your team obviously went um, Chancellor Claire and did some research, was looking at servers, looked at the technology, uh, looked at the captioning, right? So some of that that so obviously there's work underway. So I'm just curious as a board member, um, I think what you were doing was saying, well, here's this, it's, this certainly doesn't reflect anything that, um, that we just, that Vice Chancellor Bailey just showed us, right? So what was the idea just to say, here's the best of what we have today, here's some research that we've done, and what was to be the next step? In fact, I'm just wondering if what Trustee Pimentel said, is that jumping the gun a step or, uh, and that with this policy in particular, I agree with him completely around 
just the review of policies across the board. But I just wanted to take use this one as a case example to kind of set some best practice around how we could deal with things like this. Sure, and if, if I if I may um, yes. try to answer. So you know, um, this really was it. I'm kind of reading the board report itself, and um, it, it, it really was a discussion. And we probably we probably ventured into different areas, but that's okay. Um, my goal here, I'm very pragmatic. Uh, we've got a bunch of minutes to get caught up on, and the, the the current way we've been doing it is no longer sustainable. We've got technology available to us. We've got some new tools that we'll start to integrate. The one thing that I needed as chancellor tonight, and it's good to get the additional feedback as well, is does this basic format look okay? Because if it looks okay, now we're going to turn staff loose and get these darn minutes completely caught up, just as I said at the outset that our intention is to be completely caught up by the end of February. So that's our work plan, John, in terms of the minutes. So what I didn't want to do is put people to work on, on a format that wasn't going to work for you. So hearing um, uh, Trustee Pimentel's comment, and I think uh, Trustee Holliver, hey, you know, if there's a dissent, we need a little more content. Th these are all helpful things, because now we're ready to put the staff time in to get this caught up. That was my only intention tonight. Knowing, you know, we're, we we know policy like everybody else. We knew that that policy was outdated. So now that policy needs to follow the format that we'll be delivering. It, 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 it clear. So that was that was basically what I wanted tonight. The broader discussion is a good discussion to have as well. And in fact, that's part of my goal as chancellor. My formal goals that I want to talk about with the board in closed session. You know, we're we're on the same page here. We really are. Believe it. Believe it or not. So. I don't know if that helps or makes it more confusing. I think that was very helpful as far as that goes. And I, I think that the, now we understand a little bit better why the material was put, brought before us to basically uh, give us some uh, idea of where we can go using technology and a different platform for our minutes. And then if this is something that we like, then the old policy, which was there for information, was simply there to allow us to understand that it needs to be revised and then be updated so it's consistent with what our new desires, goals, and uh, processes are going to be. Uh, Trustee Oliver? So um, I guess I'm flogging a dead horse, so I apologize. I'll keep it brief. Um, <laughs> our current practice is actually better than what this policy would allow mm -hmm. because it, we, we get very detailed minutes that uh, get capture the essence of whatever comments any board member, staff, or member of the public makes. And those have been very helpful and they've been quite accurate. And I'll be honest, I always first look at what am I being quoted as saying to make sure it's right. And I have on just a couple occasions corrected those minutes. So we have a practice that's better than what's reflected in, in this policy. Um, I think on this item alone, I'm comfortable leaving it with our chancellor, knowing that he can check with uh, Trustee Pimentel and perhaps others as he is revising this. Uh, we have another bigger picture question that has been raised by Trustee Goodman and Pimentel, which I do think would be appropriate when we get to the topics for the board retreat or annual meeting, or whatever we're going to call it. Uh, so I'd prefer to wait on that till we get to that agenda item. All right. Yes, Trustee Goodman. Yeah, um, so back to the, the minutes and um, I guess the responsibility of completing those minutes, what, what, what staff member has that fallen on um, in light of us as a board not having our um, administrative assistant to not just manage the board's uh, task um, as we had an employee earlier this year in, in, the, in the past. Um, that employee also had the responsibility of drafting the minutes or uh, yeah, you know, before they're presented to the board. So who has that fallen on number one? Who will that um, responsibility fall on moving forward once we get everything set in place? And um, do we expect um, to fill that position, the board's uh, administrative assistant. 
or executive assistant, I guess. If it's if it's okay through uh, yes, Chancellor Claire, please go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Trustee Goodman. So right now it is uh, we have not had that position filled for really for quite some time, and it's fallen on Vice Chancellor Bailey. So it'll be Mitch um, at least getting us caught up. We know we got to get caught up. I think there's a there's an analysis we need to do because now has the job changed again? If we simplify the process mm -hmm. of taking minutes. Do we really need to staff that position? We know we need somebody. We, you know, this is not this this is not for um, you know Mitch to do, um, but we need to staff that position as to what extent. Because has the job been? We've actually had some discussions with staff in office of what do we need as support? Because one of the things that um, it, that you'll know about me is I I don't like to put positions in place if we don't really need them. And I mean that, you know, those of you, those that worked with me at CSM could attest to that. And so what we want to do is we want to do a, a very, we're, we're actually queued up with the position. We're ready to go. We could actually put the position out tomorrow, but I, I want to do a little bit. I wanted to get guidance from you, first of all, on, on this issue of concerning minutes and I think we've got good feedback. And then what I wanna do is I wanna assess with staff and then with the board, what kind of support does the board need? And does this, does this really now engender a full-time position or is it something where we can bring someone in or make it part of their, you know, part of other duties? And I don't have an answer for you tonight, but I'm, I wanna think that through um, carefully before we commit to a 100% a, a one, one FTEF position. Okay, all right. Um... That's the only question I had on the, the minutes and the policy. I agree with uh, moving forward with what was presented to us tonight. Uh, appreciate uh, Domin and his guidance on making, you know, hopefully uh, all this technology work and, um, you know, getting this to us and getting it to our community as soon as possible. All right. Is that the consensus of the board that at this point that we move forward with the, uh, with the process, uh, uh, which was, uh, shown tonight and move to that format so we can get these all caught up. Yes, I see one. Everyone, now go I have a head nod. Yeah, with the all change right. that was recommended uh, by both uh, Trustee Pimentel and Holliver. And uh, President Nurse, may I just get a little further clarification because there was, uh, and we're happy to do this, but there, were, but Trustee Pimentel expressed some interest in, in providing input into this particular policy. I know there's you, you have broader interest as well, Trustee Pimentel, but is that something that uh, the board would like uh, me to pursue with Trustee Pimentel? Um, yes, I think so. I'm happy to help, Mike. I'm All right, just to here respond. we go. You, I know you can do it. Yep, okay, good. Okay, we'll be in touch. Help then. is good, help is good. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, do we need anything uh, further on this item? I don't think so. Okay, so now we're going to move down to uh, 21013 c which is basically a discussion of expansion of a tuition waiver. Basically, we're talking about free tuition here. And this is a, a big item for our board. We talked about it last time, putting it on an agenda so we can kick it off and, and start giving some, uh, some ideas of where we wanna go, uh, what needs to be done, give some direction to administration, on how they can uh, help us move this forward. Um, and so um, it's open for board discussion tonight. There isn't any report uh, from the administration that I'm aware of, is there, Chancellor? I, I believe we do have a bit of a report. Well, then um, let's hear it, go right Vice ahead. Chancellor McDean is here. Um, With his tie, yes, go right ahead, Aaron. <laughs> Trustee Nurse, I didn't want you to feel alone and have the only tie in the room. So I went to, I went um, to a I went to a funeral today, so that's why I'm wearing this. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same reason. Okay. Um, yeah. so yes, I do have a little presentation for you this, this evening. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chancellor Claire, President Nurse, members of the board. Uh, it's good to see you. Happy New Year. Um, it's an interesting start to this year. Can't wait to see how we start 2022. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I've got a little feedback in my ears. All right. So I, I do have some information to present to you kind of to ground this conversation. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And there we are. All right, and this is a, a study session. So as always, um, if you have questions or comments along the way, please don't hesitate to stop me. And trusting nurse, if you can keep me honest, that'd be great. 
Um, I do want to locate this discussion um, within our discussion more broadly of our strategic plan. Um, so when we talk about our focus on equity and social justice in this district, um, we often talk about how do we remove all the barriers for students to access um, higher education as well as to succeed and complete. Um, I, I shared this data with the board back in October. Um, the importance of educational attainment in this county, in San Mateo in particular, um, is, is so great given the economy that we have. Um, and that educational attainment is not uh, evenly distributed um, across all the communities that we serve. Um, it's something that we know and it's something that, that motivates uh, many of us to do the work that we do. Um, if you don't have access to higher education, the impact in this county is so much greater simply because um, an associate's degree is great, but until folks uh, achieve even a bachelor's degree level, um, it's difficult to achieve the incomes level that make it possible to um, really um, uh, uh, survive even in this county, uh, given the housing costs, part of the reason that we are building those, those faculty staff housing units. And we know that uh, income is directly related to that education and that um, uh, as, as ex uh, um, we've seen before, uh, there's disparities between the communities that we serve with regard to per capita income. And with all of this, uh, it just puts the importance on us as a district to see what can we do to remove barriers to accessing higher education. And so tonight we're going to talk about uh, one of those uh, um, issues, and that is tuition and fees specifically. So I just want to give you uh, an overview of our current fees and tuition that we charge, um, uh, some legislation and policy that's related there, some of the flexibility and restrictions that we have as a district with regard to those fees and tuition and the revenue that comes in. Because as we also talk about removing barriers and, and um, eliminating fees and costs, it does have an impact on the, the revenue that comes into the district. And so that's also important to be aware of. And I'll just wrap up with the discussion then um, of the Promise Scholars Program and the fees that are related to that as well. Um, so most basically, uh, enrollment fees. So these are set by uh, the Board of Governors uh, at the state level. Uh, our basic enrollment fee is $46 per unit per semester. Um, we also have a baccalaureate program in the district, one of 15 in the state, that's at Skyline College and Risk Court Care. And that is $130 per unit. That's the 46 uh, plus 84 that they add for the baccalaureate degree. Uh, we don't have any flexibility in setting those uh, fee levels that are set at the state level. And they haven't changed for quite some time, fortunately. Whether or not we can waive those, um, we, we've asked the question. Uh, the education code uh, states very clearly that enrollment fees shall be charged to students. Um, and I set the education code there for you. Um, we've asked uh, for legal opinion on this matter and, and have got advice that I have also shared with you earlier and sent you that legal opinion um, that uh, we do not, do not have the option to waive these fees. Uh, and if we choose not to collect them, um, you see there the underlying statement, and this is from the Ed Code, the Board of Governors shall reduce apportionments by up to 10% to any district that does not collect the fees prescribed by this section. The one area in which we do not charge enrollment fees um, uh, for uh, uh, students is in concurrent and or dual enrollment. Um, and so that is uh, allowed in education code, specified in education code. Uh, code. Um, those are considered special admit students in the code. And so a student who's a high school student has not graduated yet can enroll um, in college classes and not pay a fee. And this is also true of dual enrollment that was expanded through AB 288 that we've discussed here before. Um, and a student can enroll up to 15 units under a CCAP agreement, AB 288 dual enrollment, and does not pay for those. And this is one of the areas that we have seen um, significant growth in the district. Um, uh, right now, as we head towards the start of the semester, uh, we're actually um, again, enrollment is, is slightly down, but we're, we're up in headcount as a district. Um, and we hope that that trend continues to the start of the semester. A lot of that headcount increase is due to the dual enrollment activity, in particular at Skyline College. And so um, really to thanks to the efforts of Andrea Visner and Dr. Jennifer Taylor Mendoza, really leading those efforts for the district. And it is uh, also free to those students who enroll in those programs. Um, the next fee that we have is the non-resident tuition fee. Um, and so 
This is a fee that is on top of the $46 per unit fee uh, for non-residents specifically. Uh, again, we are required to set a non-resident tuition fee if we choose to accept non-resident students. Um, and right now we have it at $288 per unit per semester on top of the $46 enrollment fee. Um, the education code requires us to set this uh, tuition fee uh, by March 1st each year. You'll actually see us come back in February with that recommendation. Um, we don't do this um, in a vacuum. Um, uh, and there's a link here that I'll share with you all. Um, we are actually given seven criteria to set our non-resident tuition fee um, and uh, there's limitations within there. Um, the green writing here, and you'll see this on a few other slides, the green writing uh, really does um, uh, show that we have ultimate flexibility in this particular type of fee. Um, this one is a, a, a non-resident capital outlay fee specifically for non-residents who are also not um, citizens of the US and we do charge currently a $2 per unit non-resident international uh, capital outlay fee for, for students um, who are enrolled uh, as international students. Um, the uh, one area where we can waive the non-resident tuition fee, um, we commonly refer to this as the AB 540 exemption. Um, it's actually education code cited there. Um, and this is uh, part of the, uh, for, for the dreamers in California. Um, so uh, an, an undocumented student who has otherwise attended one of the it, uh, institutions listed there, public institutions of, of education in the state for, it doesn't have to be consecutive for three years, um, um, or in, um, they've expanded this recently to also include adult schools as well as community colleges. Um, and once they've achieved that three year mark, um, qualify for the AB 540 exemption. And so that's when we can waive the non-resident tuition fee. They still do pay the enrollment fee, that $46 per unit, but we can then waive the non-resident tuition fee. And this is the one uh, allowance for waiving non-resident um, automatically. And then the last one is an option that a board um, may adopt. Um, uh, Trustee Goodman, to your point earlier, looking at policy, um, this is where we have the flexibility. How conservative, uh, how liberal are we on our different policies? And this is um, uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited to bring this conversation to the board um, and to continue it hopefully at our um, annual uh, planning meeting. Um, we can uh, exempt uh, students who are non-resident and take six or fewer units. Um, uh, however, uh, some opinions that we have, or, or one opinion that we have got is that that must be for all non-resident students if they take six or fewer units and that we cannot make um, exceptions based on um, uh, individuals. Um, however, I, I still think it's an open question of whether we can make exemptions for specific groups of students, but I think there's more discussion and more analysis that we would need um, on that particular um, exemption. There's other exemptions to the non-resident tuition fee, um, but this is the one most relevant for us as a district, and I think as we mentioned our last meeting. And then, like I said, we will be bringing, um, uh, setting that fee um, in February because it is, uh, we have to set it each year by March 1st. So this is the revenue that is impacted uh, based on um, uh, uh, whether or not we do waive fees. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a break here after the slide, and see if there's any questions specifically on enrollment and, re and tuition fees. Um, looking just at fiscal year 1920, and I, I have the year to date there for the current fiscal year as well. But you'll see um, for the enrollment fee, that $46 per unit, um, 17 million and change um, came into the district. And then you see for the, for the baccalaureate degree as well, the next line you see is, is the, the California Promise Grant or CCPG used to be known as the BOG fee waiver. And so we first, we charge the enrollment fees and then if a student qualifies for CCPG, then we waive that those enrollment fees for that particular student. And so that is based on income level and different criteria um, and is set by the state um, again. Um, and you see there that um, net we take in around um, 10 million, 9 million and change in enrollment fees after returning um, uh, the, the, the CCPG, the, the BOG fee waiver for the students that qualify. Moving down, we have non-resident uh, tuition. Um, you see there we break it out for students who are out of state, um, distance learning only and then um, our international students, um, which is the bulk of the non-resident tuition fee. 
um, you'll see the change from, from year to year because of this online environment um, that, that the non-resident tuition paid by students who are just online has increased significantly and um, we anticipate to continue to um, increase for this year and possibly years as we move forward. Um, but that's definitely due to the COVID pandemic, that shift. Um, as we um, uh, continue to offer um, classes to our international students, but they're not here um, in the country. And then you see the total revenue there uh, for both the enrollment fees and non-resident tuition around 18 million for 1920 fiscal and how we're trending this year. And then the capital outlay fee that I mentioned that we take for non-resident international students. And so um, when we're talking about you know, our flexibility and, and being able to remove barriers and waive um, or, or what can we do to uh, waive more enrollment fees, um, that th these are the income levels that we currently have that would then be impacted. Um, so let me stop there uh, before I move on to other types of fees um, and see if there's any immediate questions on enrollment tuition. Trustee Goodman. Yes, I was wondering if you were, or if you are prepared to speak to the difference between what City College is doing and what we do here with Promise. Um, you know, City College San Francisco has a free community college, and so basically, anyone in San Francisco um, can get free community college. Doesn't matter their need. Here we have what we call a Promise, and it's needs based. And um, while we don't focus so much on the, uh, it's a, we try to focus on the last dollar. And so could you explain that concept? Um, I'd have to look more into City College, the exact okay. nature of City College's program. Um, however, um, they are still paying the enrollment. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're paying fee, the, well, the correct? city, yeah. the city pays somehow the city um, either, gives them, they appropriate, uh, I mean, uh, they give them a certain amount of money to cover um, those fees and then that it's covered. Um, and so, and what we do, you know, with the promise is kind of last dollars, not focusing on, because the students that need the support, they're getting the support in our county, in our, in our district. Um, however, they may not be getting the additional support with regards to food insecurity, books and all those other, uh, areas where they might see some type of uh, barrier with regards to um, completing college. Got it. Um, uh, I do believe that that City College may have passed a parcel tax yeah, that do. partially funds 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 those fees. Yes. Yeah, so um, and 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 then um, what I would assume, and and this is where we can look in more uh, exactly what they did with their board policy, and then I would assume that they passed policy about how uh, the qualifications to to then waive those fees. Um, and I and I think that's where the 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 um, the the conversation for this is: um, uh, Are we interested in investigating something similar where we could adopt? Um, uh, different criteria for waiving fees as long as we hopefully had funding then to support that. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's just trying to understand that what we're really trying to get at. Um, when you, if, if you're a student with that, that doesn't, that, uh, that has a means in San Francisco, I wouldn't want that student taking dollars away from a student that has need. And so I guess that's my concern. I don't want us to follow a slippery slope of thinking that, hey, just saying free college for the sake of saying free college, while we have students that can definitely afford to pay for their college, um, while we have students of need um, that should be getting not just their uh, tuition wave, but also get support around books, around tutoring, around uh, computers, or the other things that we're doing with our, our promise. So it's one thing to say free community college is another thing to say, expand our promise program to include more students. Um, and I believe uh, uh, Kathy Blackwood is here. Did you have your hand up, Kathy? Yeah. Um, so first of all, San Francisco did pass a parcel tax, which gave them a restricted source of money, which they used to then pay for those fees. So they haven't technically waived them. They're instead using a different funding source to pay for those fees. 
Similarly, AB 19 is money from the state that we get, and we use those to pay for the enrollment fees for our promise students. And that's a specific restricted pot of money that we can use that. Um, waiving our fees, just saying, well, we're not going to charge them to you, except under the CCPG program that the state runs and determines, we don't have the authority to waive them ourselves. So then, as Trustee Goodman was saying, the trick would be to find other resources to use to support the students, whether it's by paying their fees or helping them with books or technology or food or you know other things of that sort. Yeah, and 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 thank you, Kathy. Uh, so so uh, that that parcel tax thing, yes, as a restricted source of funds that they use to pay for the fees is allowable. Um, that's one of the discussions that we've had where fund one dollars are general fund dollars. Um, we can't use to pay for the fees, but if we have a restricted source of funds such as the foundation money that we, we we would have access to or other sources of funds we could use that um, in addition and i think um, uh, what your question might al have also been is is if we have th those funds those restricted funds that we have from another source like a parcel tax for example can we set criteria around um, who qualifies for those fees um, such as based on income level um, and uh, I, I think that's definitely one area where there's been consistency that um, income level is definitely an allowable um, way of determining um, who should qualify for certain um, types of additional benefit. Um, this also relates to and um, uh, other fees that we charge, such as health fees, um, where currently um, health fees apply to all students, and we brought a uh, uh, a waiver of board policy so that we um, charge health fees to all students, even who are 100% online now. Um, but we, it's within our ability as a district to uh, limit who we charge even health fees to. Um, we would want to do that thoughtfully. Uh, we would want to have some analysis based on our own criteria so that um, uh, uh, we would not uh, potentially, you know, we would, would avoid any um, charge of discrimination with who gets to have their fees waived or um, a charge of gift of public funds, for example. Um, but the, the conversations we've had with legal counsel is using income level to determine who we waive fees for is definitely a, a, a typical allowable um, uh, exemption. And, and I, if I could just chime in, I, and I, you, you basically said, but I, and uh, Trustee Goodman, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I think this is the policy decision before the board going forward is if we are somehow able to expand this program What's the board's policy? What, what's your take on who gets those resources and, and how do we get there? I, I, again, I think that's what I'm hearing your, your question or your point. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, and it'll be an interesting discussion we have, I think. Trustee Holliver. Uh, a couple of questions. First, um, are there, um, is, is there any mechanism for a district to ask for a waiver? of the requirement, I assume it's a requirement of the uh, Board of Governors or the State Chancellor. Uh, do you know if there are ways to ask for a waiver of the requirement to charge a fee? So um, I, I think there's probably a couple of different avenues that can be taken. One could be to actually change the encode. Um, uh, this one is, is outside of the of Title V, so this would be, I do believe, an act of the legislature to change this education code. The other would be for an exemption specifically for um, our district or a group of districts. Um, for example, Long Beach City College has some very specific language um, uh, included in some of the ed code just for um, their relationship where the Long Beach promise came out of and the transition of high school students to Long Beach. Um, so it's, it, there is precedent, it's not unheard of to have um, a district um, with a specific criteria listed, um, but that would be um, a, a, a legislative change or a Title V change depending on the area um, that we could propose, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, so we, I think you said there are basically three uh, criteria on, on which uh, a student gets a waiver. And one is participation in the Promise Scholars Program. That qualifies for a waiver, correct? Uh, is, that, is that correct for that student? 
Um, so uh, participation in the Promise Scholars Program, um, uh, we don't waive the fees, we pay for the fees unless they qualify for the, the CCPG. So um, what Kathy had said was um, there's criteria for the use of the AB19 funds. Um, you can use those, you don't have to, we choose to. Uh, you can use those to pay for the fees of students who are enrolled, first time students who are enrolled full time and then are enrolled consistently from term to term. And so that's one of the ways that we um, uh, pay for the fees in the Promise Scholars Program is the use of those funds. Um, right now, about 75% of the students qualify for CCPG. They, they, they qualify for the, the Board of Governors fee waiver, the, the California College Promise Grant. And so we are paying for the, the other students, we're paying for their enrollment fees using AB 19 funds. So we could theoretically, I'm not advocating for it, I'm just really trying to understand what the rules are. Expanding the Promise Scholars Program would be one way that we could use to exempt uh, an additional group of students from their having to pay since we pay. Uh, so is that correct? Uh, I, I understand your question. Um, it, it's not. So uh, expanding the Promise Scholars Program is something that we absolutely want to do. Um, but the participation in that program does not allow us to waive the fees. And expansion of that program is right now hinges on being able to pay for the enrollment fees of the additional students who we would take in. And I, I have a, a slide here I can bring up for you related to that. So right now um, in, in the last uh, fiscal year, 1920, so we paid for $795,500 in enrollment fees with AB19 money. Um, if we had had to pay for all of the enrollment fees, it was about 2.2 million, but because 75% of the students qualify for CCPG, we were legally allowed to waive those fees, which means we didn't have to pay for them. Um, but then uh, this is what was left over. Um, it, students who are low income, first generation, they get priority points when we do the application process. So that's why we have such a high number of low income students in our Promise Scholars Program. They get priority for being at certain income levels, uh, the expected family contribution levels as well as first generation, former foster youth, homeless, and veterans. If we were to expand the program, we're going to bring in more of those students who probably won't qualify for CCPG. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't have need though. Um, the, the, the income levels that are, are set are, are relatively low for quali to qualify. The expected family contribution, depending on the year, is anywhere from 15 to 20,000. But, you know, someone with an expected family contribution, um, at, you know, for financial aid of even 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 in our county still has need. And so um, if we were to, you know, uh, and which is always my desire to expand the, the Promise Scholars Program, we have to identify additional flexible funds, restricted funds. Um, we, we, we utilize all of our AB19 funds right now, and plus some foundation funds, as well as funds from auxiliary services to pay for all of the fees um, associated with Promise Scholars. In order to expand it, we would need additional flexible funds and or be able to um, expand that waiver to get some kind of exemption to be able to put potentially general fund dollars towards that program. Again, taking away from the, the bottom line of, of collecting enrollment fees, but that's what we would need for that flexibility if we don't have the, the outside funding sources, auxiliary services, foundation, other sources, parcel tax like City College does. So just so I understand, you're saying we fully utilize the, you're saying AB19 funding yeah. capacity. So, um, okay, so we spoke briefly about City College. I'm, I'm trying to get my hands around the notion that somebody pays, if I'm understanding this, the parcel tax in San Francisco is paying the community college, City College, for some number of students fees. Uh, so it's not that the student has to pay, uh, some payor has to pay. And it sounds like there may be prohibitions on the general fund, but other payors can, can pay, is that getting it right? 
Right. So if you have restricted funds from an, another source, you can use that to cover those enrollment fees. You can't so, use general uh, fund, but you can cover those enrollment fees. Okay. So, uh, Aaron, we go to the um, when we go to the foundation, and the foundation raises money for Fr Fr Promise Scholars. We have the president's uh, luncheons uh, up at Skyline every year, and members of the community are invited to come and to support this program. And, and a lot of money is raised from the community there, and then it channels itself to the foundation and then backfills the amounts that we're talking about there. Isn't that the way that works? Yes, and, and um, some, of those, uh, some of the money that's raised is, is potentially used to cover um, fees that AB19 cannot cover. Uh, some of the, the money goes towards supporting the monthly, uh, the monthly incentives that students receive, right? They receive $50 a month. Um, that's about $900,000 a year for the 2000 students. Um, some of the money potentially is used to, to cover the book uh, vouchers that we provide. So again, because of the limits on, on general fund monies, um, you know, we have some lottery funds that have some flexibility, other areas, but yes, it's those so flexible those are, funds that allow- So the whole point the is, is that we can't look to the general fund. We have to go to other funds. Let's talk about auxiliary services. What does, what does auxiliary services kick into this equation here every year? How much, how much do they pay towards uh, basically students being able to go for free? They have been contributing $400,000 per year. Four hundred thousand dollars per year. Correct. Thank you. Can I ask one one last I have question? A question. So, Go ahead, Richard. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, sure. So just going back to one of the earlier um, slides, if that's the right term for a PowerPoint, uh, it said that um, State Chancellor, um, the Board of Governors shall reduce apportionment by up to ten percent to any district that does not collect the fees prescribed by the section, uh, do we receive apportionment funding from the state of California? Uh, no, we do not. So, um, so in the past, as a basic aid. whenever I've raised the question about the fact that we are in violation of the 50% rule, what I've been told by our staff is don't worry about it because they would uh, hit us by, by, by cutting our apportionment, but they can't because we get zero apportionment so we can be scofflaws because there's no penalty. I just wanna point out that what is good for the goose is good for the gander. So for the benefit of trustees who may have not been through these discussions, there is no enforcement uh, currently against our district in, unless and until uh, we once again become a, a revenue limit district. There would be no penalty. That's all. Correct. That, that's also my understanding. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank are, you are we at a point now? Yes. I just, want, I, I just want to raise one uh, point uh, on an earlier slide, the one before this. Can you go back? The, it was another table sure. that had, uh, it was a table further on down where you wanted to, where it started to show the person. Uh, that might be it right there. Yeah. I just want to make a point, and this is for a further discussion. But uh, if you look all the way to the bottom there and you look at books, I just want to raise the issue here that costs of materials for students are 50 to 70% of their total cost for their education at the community college. And there are now open textbook projects. There is the zero uh, cost textbook degree. Uh, Newsom just put $15 million in the ed budget for open educational resources. This is a, a line item that we could absolutely put, you know, it doesn't go to zero completely because there have to be faculty incentives around adopting open content. So it's, does, it's not no cost, but when you look at the, the, the line item for students, we can eliminate 50 to 70% of the cost of their education to the student through the use of open educational resources. And I know this is a very important conversation about the fees and I've learned a lot. Thank you so much, Aaron. I, I'm, we need to take some, you know, make some good policy here, but this is just like a glaring obvious way that we can really have a significant impact for students. Yeah, absolutely, Trustee Petrides. And thank you, for, thank you for bringing that up and mentioned that because 
that is um, one of the areas that we definitely want to focus on because that that can reduce not only the cost for all students, it reduces the cost of the Promise Scholars program and the need to have um, uh, additional funds for books that possibly could be used for other components of that. Um, I was also pleased to see that they have at least that in the governor's proposed budget to keep expanding those efforts. Um, and I know that we have um, we have faculty groups um, um, at all three colleges who've been working on developing those resources. And it's definitely an area that we need to expand and invest in to expand rapidly because it does reduce the costs um, for our students. So thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. So um, are, you, are you going to continue with your uh, presentation, Eric? Um, uh, Trustee Pimentel, I see a hand, and then I was going to cover. Oh, a few no, other I'm, I'm, I'm happy to wait till you're finished presenting all your material, Aaron, please. Great. Um, so, as I mentioned, we do have some other fees um, that we uh, are, as a district, you as a board, um, have uh, flexibility over setting. Um, the two that we have are health fees and parking fees. Um, as you see there, what we charge are health fees $18 in the summer, $21 in fall and spring. Um, as I mentioned, we did uh, ask for a, a, a temporary suspension of our board policy that prevented us from charging health fees for online only students. Um, because now we do have, um, you know, one of the, the, the impacts of the COVID is we've had to rapidly develop telemed and other services. Um, we've, we've actually also brought on a timely MD as a service in order to provide crisis intervention service um, for hours where we are not staffed. And so, um, but we set those health fees and we determine whether or not we collect them. And as I mentioned, um, we also are able to um, exempt certain groups of students from those health fees if we so choose to as a district, um, again, within reason and, and, and to do so responsibly. And then the other that we have is, is parking fees and you see the rates there and I can bring you down to um, um, both uh, revenue for both of those types of fees. Um, and, and just to, to highlight, um, it's also our decision making where if we choose to waive fees or, or modify fee rates, um, it, it does impact uh, revenue to the district and you see there. Um, that 2021 parking uh, situation, that, that uh, you know, entirely the COVID impact. And so we're definitely going to, that's one of the areas that we have to address um, uh, for this fiscal year to backfill because of the impact of COVID. Um, and then you see um, our healthy revenue that typically is there and uh, based on um, uh, enrollments. Um, again, um, that's one of the areas that we do though have all the control over, uh, Trustee Gibbon, to your point, and it's up to us to just determine um, which direction we wanna go, right? And then finally, associated student fees. Um, we're required to collect the student rep fee and send a dollar of every two off to the state to support the state uh, uh, student uh, uh, body, uh, student association. Um, the student body fee itself, uh, the students are the ones who get to determine whether they want to charge or not, and then they have control over those funds. And then the student union fee, um, um, we as a district use a board determine whether or not we charge a student union fee, and currently we charge a $1 fee um, that goes to support uh, student unions, the, the, the buildings uh, um, that, that hold the student unions. Uh, and just to, to wrap up, as I mentioned, um, you know, one of the areas we do want to look at uh, expanding, it's been a, a strategic priority for this board, this district is really that expansion of Promise Scholars. Um, and right now our, our main limitation on the fee side is the flexible fees. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind us all that, that while this is the fee side, it also comes with the staffing side, right? Our, our staffing level is is the, the ratio is 150 to one for our counselors, as you heard uh, at our, uh, at our uh, study session on the strategic plan, the importance of that counselor relationship. And that's about another $1,600 per student per year, just on the staffing side. Um, but it's about completion and it's about the importance of that completion for students um, that we saw in the first three slides. And then finally, and, and a few of you jumped these ones, but um, some of our main considerations that relate to this um, uh, are listed here for you. Um, expansion of dual enrollment is definitely uh, a big priority. Not only can students not, not pay any enrollment fees who are enrolled in dual enrollment, um, but it's, one of the, it's a great uh, recruitment tool, uh, outreach tool, and it leads directly into our district for many of these students. And again, um, we've had a, a great expansion, the Skyline College really leading for the district on that. 
Uh, we want to double that Promise Scholars program and and, and Trustee Petridis, as you see, expansion of the open educational resources is, is definitely a part of that to reduce costs. Continue to our support of basic needs because we know once the students are here to keep them go moving through, we have to address especially the emergency situations that come up for our students as we're learning all too painfully now. Uh, and that requires flexible funds, um, hopefully pot potentially flexibility for use of our general fund dollars um, and um, encouraged to continue to explore what authority we have as a district and you have as a board to um, control these fees and put limits and potential new waivers on them. So looking forward to continuing this discussion now and at our annual planning retreat in February. So that's the last I have for you and I will uh, open it up for more questions, comments. Thank you all. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for a great presentation. I think you shared a lot of information that is very helpful to at least get us going. Uh, any other questions or comments right now of Aaron so we can continue and move this? Yes, uh, Trustee Pimentel. Um, <clears throat> I guess because I've been the one shouting about uh, the concept of tuition free, I should clarify uh, my point a little bit. Uh, first of all, Aaron, this is great information. Thank you very much for pulling it together on short notice. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I think it gives us some really good uh, uh, data to work with and um, some perspectives to consider. Uh, Maurice, I couldn't agree more uh, with your comment that what we don't want to do with a tuition-free concept is uh, help the people who don't need help. The goal is to help the people who are most vulnerable and most likely to be price sensitive in whether or not they choose to attend uh, community colleges. There's an elasticity somewhere Price is only one of the factors I think that goes into whether or not somebody enrolls. Of course, there's lots of other things going on in people's lives that affect whether or not they want to make a commitment to go to the community college, but price is clearly one of them. And so the more that we can do to identify how to remove those barriers, uh, I would see, I would expect we'd have an increase in enrollment. And, uh, and when, I, when I've referred to tuition free as a catchphrase, it really is um, uh, is just that. It's a catchphrase for removing those barriers. And it could be doubling Promise Scholars. It could be wiping out parking fees. It could be uh, free books or, uh, or um, uh, uh, lessening, or I should say, increasing the net for uh, eligibility for financial aid. And it could also be funded if we take a big enough and expansive enough view of this, um, you know, let's not talk about what we're authorized to do and what we can do. Richard, I agree with your point completely. Let's do it and see what happens. Uh, there, there's, there's no enforcement that says we can't waive fees other than losing apportionment, which is 10% of zero. Uh, likewise, I, I think we have the uh, capability to go change state law or regulation um, with a little bit of effort. And I think it if we can paint a big enough vision, we can also make other ancillary revenue sources come to us either through the foundation, through new ways of approaching employers and doing uh, coordinated training, um, and maybe even going to the county supervisors and saying, hey, do you wanna be part of tuition-free uh, or cost-free community college in our county and see if we can get the county supervisors to throw in uh, the same way uh, San Francisco did, or maybe even going back to the voters and asking them to participate uh, in this vision. So all those things, I think, should be on the table. And what I was, I was so pleased to hear from my colleagues on the board is it seems like we have a real common goal around eliminating these barriers, especially for uh, 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 first generation college students and, uh, and other uh, financially marginal students who may not come to community college because of parking, health fees, tuition, books, et cetera. And in fact, uh, Aaron, one of, one of the analyses from the district uh, that I referred to a lot over the last year was for an independent student living on their own uh, in our county, it can cost up to 15,000, over $15,000 a year just to attend our community college and tuition's only 10% of that. So. Um, looking at this on the global scale, I think is is critical. So 
I'm really excited to dig into this more deeply, and I'm hopeful that um, as we as we talk about it, staff brings uh, less of an approach to say we can't do this, and this is why the regulations tell us we can't do it, and to focus on bringing some ideas to say, all right, board, if you want to make this happen, you're going to need to go tear down some barriers yourself, like changing state law or getting money from the county supervisor or raising more money at the foundation, whatever the case may be. So um, I, I think that's great. And at the end of the day, I, you know, it's kind of a personal thing for me. I was a student at a time when we had tuition-free community college in California. And in fact, Maurice, I don't know if we've ever uh, uh, connected on this, but I was student body president in my community college when they first put the, uh, the tuition in, in 1985. And so uh, we tried to organize a statewide student association to fight that initial tuition, knowing that it was gonna ultimately get higher and higher each year. Uh, and of course we failed. And so that's one of my, I guess the point is this is, so you guys know, this is kind of personal for me, we gotta fix this. Uh, and it's not just tuition, it's the overall, it's the overall picture of access. So um, thank you very much for your work, Aaron. And I'm hopeful at our annual planning uh, meeting, we can spend a lot of time rolling up our sleeves on this. Thank you. Um, you know, I guess really after hearing this, and Aaron will be the first one to tell you that this is a, this is a district-wide commitment by everyone, the presidents of the colleges. And you know, the fact, I think it's important that that we understand that this isn't, you know, a first impression right now. We're talking about this for the first time. How do you think we got the 2000 students on the Promise Scholarship? It was a heck of a lot of work and it began way before me, in fact. And so a lot of people have been working very hard to get us to where we are and we have covered a lot of ground already. And there's a lot of stuff that's in place already. And I don't think that anyone is satisfied with what it is. We have always been looking forward to expanding this, making it bigger, and making it more affordable for everyone to be able to come to our schools. So I'm glad that you know you're brought up to speed on knowing what we're doing here and what has been done before me and before everyone, because a lot of people have done a lot of work to get us to this point. So I'm acknowledging all of that good work that got us to here. And I think what we're saying as a board is that not only do we acknowledge and validate it, we want to energize it and kick it into high gear. And I think that's what you're saying, John. And I appreciate Ditto. that yes, sir. as far as it goes. 100% agree, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Plan Ch Chancellor Claire. <laughs> Planet Claire. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Chancellor Claire. <laughs> I like that, though. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb a little bit and I'll say this in public. I um, want to talk to the board about my long-term goals, but I, I actually... I love this conversation. Um, I want to, us to collectively think even kind of at that level, but even bigger and yeah, really think about a, a comprehensive San Mateo County Promise program, much similar to the Long Beach uh, Promise. You know, the reality is the a good hunk of our students go to one of our three local CSUs and it's usually San Francisco State Mm -hmm. And we have had very preliminary conversations, but I, I want an end-to-end -end solution. I am absolutely committed to the linkages of our K-12s. And in fact, if we do that right and we do it with due enrollment correctly, um, the recruiting happens automatically because it's all wired in as one big system. That's a huge project to work on. Um, but it, to me, it, it, that's my dream. That, that's, that's sort of what, you know, as a, as a resident of this county, um, and it'll continue long after, you know, I vacate my job as an educator. Um, I, think, I think we need to think really big. And I, I, you may not share that with me, and that's okay, but that's, that's, where I'm, that's what I see, and that's what I'm excited about. Uh, can, I, uh, can I go to uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey? I think we have a, a public comment. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You have one public comment, Loretta. All right. Loretta, you are, uh, you are on. If you unmute yourself, please. Hello, Loretta. If uh, we can take off the mute, we'd love to hear from you.
Can anyone help here? IT people? No? Loretta, if you can unmute yourself, uh, just click on the, the unmute button, that'd be great. There you go. We can hear you now. Oh, no. Can you let her know what the um, button is on the phone? Is it like star six or something? Yeah, it's if she's probably using on the. Okay, it looks like you're unmuted now, Loretta. Hello. No, oh, she's still muted. Oh. Maybe can she could put the question in the chat or something. Yes, she Q and A. I'm muted now. Th th there she is now. All right, Loretta. Hello. I think that was an error. I apologize, but thank Not you a for problem. All your work on the board. We, we really appreciate all your efforts. Happy New Year. Same to you. Mr. President, you have an, another uh, speaker, uh, Monica Malamud. All right. I'm prepared to hear from Monica again. Please, is Loretta finished? Loretta, are yes. you completed? Yes, hi. Um, so what I'm going to say is probably going to be counterintuitive and controver controversial, but Please bear with me. Um, I believe that there is nothing wrong with having a tuition-free education at the community college level for all, even if that includes people who have the means to afford it, because that's actually what this country has for pre-K-12 education. It is tuition-free for all. It doesn't matter what your income level is. Uh, it has also been said by, you know, some of you or one of you already that in order to, you know, to have the income level that is necessary to live in this area, um, a community college education is not even uh, enough, uh, not even a bachelor's degree, I heard. Um, you need beyond a bachelor's degree. So if you really want to remove barriers to um, that, you know, to access education, I would urge you to look at our uh, a model that's similar to the uh, City College of San Francisco model, where no students have to pay enrollment fees. And the reason why I'm saying that is because the um, uh, when a student needs to demonstrate that they have a certain need, that is an additional barrier to access their education. There's another la layer of bureaucracy that's a burden to the most needy students. So this bureaucratic, you know, you're trying to remove a financial barrier, but in doing so, you're adding a bureaucratic barrier, okay? So, uh, and, and then I, I wanna give you a personal example. You know that I'm a faculty member here. I mentioned since when, about 20 years in the district, I can offer my educational experience. You can place me in the salary schedule because that's public. I have two masters and a PhD. So you know what my salary is. With two sons attending community college, my sons qualify for full federal financial aid. So uh, sometimes I've heard board members talk about, you know, our needy students, the students that, you know, well, my sons are among those students, actually. Uh, the federal government believes that my income is not enough, you know, after taking into account the total cost of education and the expected family contribution. I don't make enough money. So before moving into a, a, um, a model that looks as, at who's wealthy and who's not, I think it would be interesting to see what's the percentage of so-called wealthy students uh, in our district. Because my two sons, for example, would not be some of those students. Um, so that's why I really would hope that you would look into a model where you're not adding a new barrier uh, for our students to access their education. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, anyone else, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey? No, sir, I think that's it. Thank you. Well, I think we've had a very stimulating discussion on this item and um, we will move forward with it. Uh, this will be something that I'm sure we're gonna take up uh, further uh, at our uh, retreat or whatever we want to call it, uh, but it's something that is an ongoing concern. It's not a singleton one-time item. Uh, as you can see, it's been going on for a long time. We're going to continue with it, and I, I think uh, administration has gotten the signal that uh, the board is prepared to uh, pull out the stops, and uh, let's be aggressive as we can. All right. Thank you. We'll move to the next item, which is uh,
<laughs> discussion of potential topics for the annual board retreat. So we have that, uh, that's a given. Everyone knows that that's one of the things we wanna talk about. Uh, and uh, so who would like to throw out other items they'd like to hear from? Trustee Goodman. <laughs> You are on if you unmute. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, back in 2000, um, I'm, I wasn't here. <laughs> I'm not sure if Richard, Richard, you were here, right or no? Yes, um, I was. Yeah, yeah. So there was a resolution uh, to address the parity uh, with our uh, adjunct faculty. And this board passed that resolution. And then within a year, of passing that resolution or within that same year. Um, and since we've done nothing as a board to address the resolution that we passed. And so I would hope um, that this body can um, review and um, recommit ourselves to um, addressing, uh, you know, what we stated in that resolution to address um, worker uh, parity. Um, and another topic, uh, obviously something that we carry over from last year would be uh, student housing. Um, a board policy committee that we've already talked about tonight, um, which would be made up of um, a number of board, board, two board members. And um, basically just kind of how we discussed it tonight where we would um, um, look at policies um, as, we, as, we, as we've stated, um, in the last couple of meetings um, that we want to begin to kind of do a, a review of how things are done within our district, looking at policies. I think there was some, some question that are some, some of the policies include nepotism policies, hiring practices, um, anti-racism and things like that. So I think um, having a uh, board policy committee or at least a, addressing whether or not that's um, appropriate uh, for this next year, um, I think we should discuss that. Um, and then I think uh, two more items, uh, environmental justice, uh, looking at um, energy and sustainability within our district, um, exploring what's needed for us to um, begin to, to take, make action on um, some of the things that have, been, that have been brought before us in the last year. We've talked about um, uh, energy storage uh, and, um, updating our, our practices with regards to um, bringing on board uh, new uh, vehicles or um, you know other machinery that use uh, gas and actually um, transitioning to electric and other uh, forms of um, renewable uh, energy. And then lastly, uh, uh, addressing our food insecurity and continued support of our students that we've in the past um, set aside monies um, to support our students and food insecurity at, this di at the different sites. Um, we had an expectation last year that um, we would uh, have a way to uh, give students some type of cards or loadable cards um, to address food insecurity at the different sites working with the cafeterias. Um, just to make sure that we don't lose sight of that. Obviously, COVID came and, you know, that put a lot of things on the back burner. But if we could um, have some conversations on, on, on the progress we're making towards that, that goal that we set last year. Thank you. Um, any other board members uh, would like to uh, share some thoughts on items, even though that's a, that's a very uh, extensive list and uh, all very important items. Um, any other trustees? Yes, Trustee Holliver. So uh, those are all important items. I wanna raise, uh, I think circle back to what was hinted at um, when we were discussing the minutes uh, by Trustee Pimentel and Trustee Goodman. And, you know, we have an opportunity here with uh, a new chancellor, uh, new board members, to take a new look at our governance uh, structure and how we function as a governing board. And I think this is the biggest picture uh, 
thing that the board uh, should be looking into. We've approached it and backed away from it. Last year at a board retreat, um, there was interest raised, for example, by me and other trustees in establishing an internal auditor position, a uh, position that would report to the board that would have some authority to help the board with the process of reviewing policies and reviewing practices, uh, making recommendations. This would be not a decision maker, but someone who could be devoted to those reviews um, and benchmarking against other districts and against best practices. Um, I've also raised in the past in, in uh, retreats that I believe we need the board to step up to the plate and um, acknowledge that there are a number of processes that require an independent review. Um, I believe we are, you know, we each have backgrounds that bring to this district areas of expertise, uh, you know, areas where we have deep knowledge. Um, but what we don't have, I, you know, I think in the system of lay governance, we don't work at this full time. Um, many of us have day jobs. We meet a couple times a month for a few hours. We also can get engaged in other activities, but we're not full time, nor should we be full time employees of the district. And I think there are uh, areas that um, require, in my opinion, independent review by neutral experts who have no dog in the fight, uh, who report to the board and provide the board with information that allows us to then make the, the best decisions about what changes. Maybe we're, we, we, we do a review and we learn that we're doing great. Um, so what, what I think I would like to see uh, a, a, a big part of this retreat be about how do we do the systematic review? Um, so these specific issues are, I think, all very important. Um, you know, let's take part-time parity, for example. Uh, certainly an important issue we've heard a lot about from uh, our faculty. Um, that would, in my opinion, be a perfect example of the kind of thing that the board would say, you know, let's hire neutral experts. They talk to our administration, they talk to other districts, they do their own research, they bring back neutral, unbiased data, and then the board has the basis to review and then make decisions, and we make the policy decisions. So I'd be very interested in having a discussion about how we take advantage of the changes in our executive ranks and in the board to embrace a um, somewhat different um, role for the board in, in, in our governance. Thank you. All right. Um, we've got a pretty long list here at this point. Uh, yes. I was just I, I, uh, we have Trustee Goodman and then Trustee Petridis. I was just going to add that um, obviously uh, between the three of you, you, uh, Chancellor Claire and, and Trustee Hollywood can probably synthesize them and kind of place yes. them where they can kind of, some, some of them overlap, I think. And yes. um, working with staff, I think we can um, make it work, make it a, a workable agenda. And if, if, if it's okay, if I could add, yeah, you know, we, we will, it's, it's, we want to make sure we give enough time to give the important topics the attention they deserve. And so the other thing I was going to suggest, we will do our best. And I know, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working with President Norris and, and Vice President Holliber, but I always, particularly for our new board members, I always kind of see this also as if we can't get to every one of them, it becomes the start of study sessions too, in my mind, right? And so um, it doesn't mean that, you know, if we can't, <laughs> if we can't get in on that Saturday, it doesn't mean it doesn't get in. We, but we just got to be, um, we just got to make sure that we're very um, uh, intentional about if we don't get it in, 
it's on a study session and we actually calendar that in. So, because I, I, these are all really great topics. Trustee Petridis. Yeah, I guess this re this retreat is going to be, what, a week long to cover all these? I, I think. So let me just add to the list here uh, sure. for consideration is I really want to both have a better understanding, but I think probably do some brainstorming about uh, the district's use of data around planning and instruction uh, around student persistence and completion. You know, we, we see some numbers here and there and that's great, right? You report to the state, but I actually would like to dig in a bit deeper uh, into actually how we're using those kinds of data, making what kinds of decisions around these issues around student achievement. Um, so that's one piece. Um, the second piece is related. Um, as you know, I really come from this open education and curriculum background. I I'd love to be able to look at that also from the academic perspective. I want to understand um, where are we around, you know, transforming curriculum to make it relevant, you know, culturally responsive, relevant to the workforce needs, uh, relevant to what transfer needs today. Um, those, so I'm not sure where those conversations come and in fact, they, they touch upon some of the other issues that my colleagues have already put on the agenda. But these are some things I'd like to add. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Pimento. Tom, you didn't think I wouldn't have anything to chip in on this. <laughs> I'm saying he can't come, come up with anything else. We only have 14 items there. Oh, no, you just gave me the invitation that uh, you are. You have the green light. Go for it. Even, even, though, we won't, <laughs> even though we won't cover all these items uh, at our annual planning meeting open to the public, formerly known as retreat, um, <laughs> I, I actually do want to list these things out. Uh, because, uh, and, and Mike, you might want to get a fresh pen with plenty of ink and a notepad. Uh, excellent. Because I just, I think we ought to knock these things down uh, over the course of the year, maybe over the course of the next four years. I don't know, but these are things that are on my mind. So uh, number one is uh, I'm happy to hear Aaron report that our, our enrollment is increasing. If you look at it over the last decade, though, it's clearly declining. And I, I want to try and understand why that is. You know, is it uh, how are we actually marketing our product to the community? Who are we trying to attract? Uh, and are we communicating with them effectively? Um, next is uh, maybe along the lines of what Lisa's suggesting as far as student success metrics and understanding really, you know, how are how do we define the success for our students? Is it is it just getting transferred or is it making it all the way through and completing a four-year degree? Is it just finishing their uh, training certificate or is it getting a job in the field in which they've studied that they can keep for a few years? Um, uh, uh, next is, uh, I, I kind of already uh, made my points about transparency, but I think that we want to have a broader cultural uh, change at the district to just be more transparent about everything. Uh, we talked a lot about tuition free, so I won't belabor that one. Uh, uh, when it comes to job training, I think we have a, a, some great programs that are uh, in the field right now, but I still have a sense that we can do a better working with employers to understand what curriculum it is that, that they want for the uh, training to be for the workers that they're going to be hiring. Again, maybe this is uh, to Lisa's point on the relevancy of our of our curriculum, but I think engagement with the employers is a big step. And I know we do a lot of it already, um, but I'd like to emphasize, figure out how we can expand that. Um, a, a big issue for me in the category of access is considering satellite campuses. I mean, it's kind of ironic now because we don't even need any campuses when we're virtual. Uh, but it, it, when we return, I know uh, for a section of my district, especially down in East Palo Alto, Bellhaven, uh, it's hard to get across town and up to Kenyatta in a way that fits with our busy lives. And so uh, I'd like to uh, investigate expanding our presence uh, at the job train facility uh, or taking some other approach 
And I know that um, coastside residents also feel like getting over the hill can be a challenge. Is there a way for us to affordably look at satellite campuses? Um, we already talked about scaling up our housing effort. I agree with you there, Maurice. Uh, uh, when it comes to access and equity, uh, another thing that I would like us to work on is automatically enrolling public high school uh, juniors and seniors with the knowledge that a lot of them, about a third of them will go to a way to four-year school. About a third of them will already enroll in the community college, but there's another third that really doesn't even show up for our community college. Maybe automatic enrollment is a way of marketing to them. Um, we've spent so much time talking about the SMAC. Uh, nobody has uh, really talked about the Kenyatta athletic facility and how we want that to run. We, we have a blank sheet of paper there and uh, I've formulated some points of view on the use of the, those facilities and uh, I'd love to have the board discuss that uh, for Kenyatta. Uh, we talked a little bit today about our international programs uh, in the context of uh, creating ancillary revenues. Uh, that's great. I'd like to uh, understand how our international program fits with our mission and our revenue base of um, collecting money from county residents to educate county residents uh, and improve their lives and how the international function really fits with what we do. Um, I'd like to learn more about how our child care programs work uh, and how we can expand those to increase access. Uh, I, um, uh, I would like to also learn more about how adult education works in our county. Um, I know right now that's uh, the, the provenance of our uh, high school districts, but really um, maybe it should be in our bailiwick. Um, we, I know that the, the district has had a huge emphasis to try and increase diversity in hiring and management, um, but I don't know how we're tracking that or whether we're making uh, uh, adequate progress. And I'd like to make sure we have a, a management faculty and staff that reflects uh, the diversity of our community. Um, and then I think that uh, I'm sure there is a thorough evaluation process that we already do right now with our faculty and, and uh, our management, uh, but having, uh, having clear evaluation uh, processes uh, and scoring and reporting for how we, how we manage or how our managers manage and how our faculty performs are important. And, uh, and that completes my list. Should be a busy year. Well, I have to tell you, you did not disappoint me, John. <laughs> That's quite a list. I, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things and all of these things are important. And I think the key is, is that we, we get them on our radar. We get the list out there. Maybe what we have to do is uh, put it all together uh, I'll look at it, prioritize, so we can figure out, you know, what what is the order of doing all of this? Because obviously, uh, we want to talk about all of this, but we don't talk about it in a vacuum. It then goes back to our administration, to our schools. They all jump on. They have to give us reports, and so we got to work it into everyone's schedule. Uh, Trustee Goodman. Yeah, I was going to say, um, and I'm sure uh, a lot that is, that's been said tonight has already um, may have begun already by, uh, by staff. And so possibly, um, sorry, <laughs> possibly having um, Chancellor Claire and, and staff kind of <laughs> report uh, to the board or to uh, President uh, Nurse and Vice President Holliber as you guys uh, prepare the agenda, um, what can be, what's already uh, in the works and that, it, that can possibly be an information item at a future board meeting. Uh, number two, uh, what uh, will be priorities um, that this body sets and then what we discuss at the, uh, what'd you call it, John, information session. Annual goal, uh, goal setting and plan set. there you go. public meeting. And yeah. then probably uh, dovetailing on that, uh, Trustee Goodman, is then finding out what items are going to rise to the level of study sessions. 
and given more attention. So I think uh, I think that's a great approach for all of these things. Okay, we have our work cut out for us. Yes, Trustee Oliver. So th this list is um, not something that can be uh, addressed at, at a annual planning meeting, if, uh, if that's the consensus that we're uh, calling it. Um, I guess I want to at least get back to the point I'm making and just see, you know, if there is any appetite uh, for something I've called for for years. And it really gets into the question of what is the role of the governing board? Um, because there are a number of these items, which I believe are extremely important, um, that I would want us to address. I would want us to address these items in a different manner than we have addressed them in the past, which is why I'm proposing some structural changes. And um, I'd be happy to you know, prepare um, a memo, but um, just trying to get some sense if this is a topic of interest to other trustees. Well, actually, when you get right down to it, uh, uh, this board doesn't have a past, really, as far as sure. that goes. We are pretty much a new board, and we are we are already on the path of dealing with things. I think, which I've seen since since we've all been sworn in as a board. We are already dealing with things in a different way. We are interfacing with our administration in a different way. And so I, I think it is a process that is evolving at this particular point. And I'm, and I'm happy that we're evolving in, in a very positive direction. And so uh, I'm thinking we need to just continue to evolve as we are at this particular point and tick off these items and uh, see how much progress we can make because uh, that in and of itself is, uh, is, is quite an achievement. The fact that we're looking at things differently now. Yes, Trustee Pimentel. Well, I couldn't agree more. And, and I apologize for um, being the culprit to add to our laundry list. And I recognize, Tom, your point is exactly right. We have to prioritize and figure out how to hit the biggest items for sure. Um, my goal was in, uh, you know, giving us a list of things to do over the course of the next future quarters or years. But Richard's point um, has been on my mind as well. And in fact, I don't know if you guys saw it, but I, I just scribbled down my thoughts in a memo uh, that I sent last night. I think there's a fundamental question around how we approach uh, uh, the, a lot of the things on the laundry list in, in terms of procedures and policies. And uh, I, for one, Richard, I really like the idea of creating a, uh, uh, a resource, even an ongoing position, call it an internal auditor. In, in my campaign, I talked about it as, I called it inspector general. That's probably the wrong uh, terminology, uh, but a resource that would allow us to get some independent views, maybe use some additional third party resources but to work closely with and integrate with the administration, who I think shares our common goal of, you know, operating efficiently, effectively, and and uh, uh, transparently. And well, I think I you're right. I think we need to make that an item, one of the items that we talk about at the retreat or the, at the session. I think and, and, all of us feel that that's important enough to make that one of our items. Yeah. Super. And just the example, so that it's uh, kicked out there. Uh, when I was up in Sacramento, we had this thing called the Little Hoover Commission, which would uh, was an independent organization that would occasionally report to the le to the legislature on how to do things better. And a lot of their reports ended up sitting on shelves and collecting dust. But sometimes they found some really interesting stuff where uh, the government the government was able to optimize operations and improve service. Trustee Goodman, and I agree uh, with. Uh, Trustee Oliver and uh, Trustee Pimentel, I think, and, and you to an extent, uh, you, you said this is definitely an item that should uh, be on the agenda. And I think if I had, you know, some input on prioritizing, I think that should be at the top. Um, and so I think, you know, with the two of you um, creating this, uh, you know, this, this agenda, 
I'm okay with you got you prioritizing um, as you see fit. I, I do believe that we'll get to it. I do believe we'll have an opportunity to discuss the majority of it under something else that staff will be presenting to us. Because I do believe that over the years, uh, staff has, has, has heard us and they've brought before us information and opportunities for us to discuss exactly um, what's being brought up during this uh, agenda setting um, item right here on the agenda. So um, I wanted to say that, but also I wanna make sure that we uh, be careful what we, how we say certain things when we, we I've heard a couple of uh, trustees say, hey, there was a memo sent and I sent the memo. Um, be very clear to the public that your business is, we're doing your business publicly. Um, if memos have been sent, there's been no deliberation on any of the memos. It's been one way and um, we'll make sure in the future that those memos will be public for the majority, for the uh, public to uh, see. Yes, uh, is there a public comment? Excuse me, uh, Chancellor, uh, Vice Chancellor Bailey, is there a public comment? Uh, no, I guess we'll not, from, go ahead. I believe it's from Chancellor Claire. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm, I've been trying to raise my my electronic hand here. Um, so I actually, um, I, I actually agree 100 percent with with that priority. Um, you know, uh, I think it would help me. I, I think it would help us, uh, sort of as this as this new entity together. Uh, and I think I think part of the discussion uh, is is you know what are the best practices? What are the board chancellor best practices? What's policy versus implementation? I mean that that's a that's a that we've got to norm that somehow. And I, I am I I probably sound like a broken record, but there are also accreditation standards around this stuff that we 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 really need to just kind of get to what you know how are we going to operate together where you know i fully um support and understand that the board sets policy and the and the administration implements it i i get that 100 percent. and so for us to really have a healthy discussion and an honest discussion in full view of the public of course i welcome that because i think it's just going to um help us uh move this district forward i, I think we we spent a lot of time talking about things that you know maybe we would have been able to avoid had we had this foundation in place to begin with so trustee holliver i i, I agree with you 100 percent, and i agree with uh, the other the other comments uh that were made by the board members I'm, i i want to get to best practices what are the best practices in terms of board chancellor administration work together um because there's not enough time <laughs> get off my soapbox after this we are so busy. There is not enough hours in the day for us to, to go down, you know, and, and, and get involved with something where it could have been avoided if we, if we were really clear about, you know, and, and, and we had a common understanding in terms of policy versus implementation. So I'll, I'll stop there. I've said Thank way you. more than Thank I was you. planning on saying tonight. I think I'll create a board bubble. We'll have to just, uh, you know, um, uh, shelter in place together or something to get all this work done. But um, I'm looking forward to doing the work with you. I really am. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I need to rein us in here. This, this item was to make Sorry. a list of topics. And because <laughs> it's so exciting and interesting, we're starting to talk about them. <clears throat> and there will be plenty of time to do that. Uh, but we still have a lot of other business to do, and I'm afraid that I'm going to keep you here way too long tonight if we don't uh, move on, unless there's some uh, some pressing need for us to continue on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will work on the list and get back to everyone. Uh, this takes me now down to uh, communications. Uh, are there any uh, communications received by the board that we need to share at this point? No, I take that as a no. All right, statements from board members. Uh, any board members like to make any statements right now? Yes, Trustee Holliver. I, I believe it's essential that we uh, talk about what occurred in Washington, D.C. Uh, one week ago. And I didn't ask to put this on the agenda, um, but um, I believe that all Americans who care about our country, all patriotic Americans um, have to be beyond 
shocked, beyond appalled, uh, beyond disgusted. Um, I believe this is a time where we are called on to take action to preserve our democratic form of government because make no mistake, it was and continues to be under violent attack by neo-fascist, racist mobs who don't care about anything other than making sure that the person whose personality cult they follow wins at all odds. You know, when democracy fails to deliver the goods, that's when you see these jackboots out on the streets. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I really haven't been sleeping for the past week, to be honest, since um, a group of murderers uh, invaded the Capitol. Um, so I know uh, as a college district, we sometimes feel our job is to be called on to comfort our students. And certainly we're not here to call on our students to do anything other than what they think is their civic duty. Um, but I am, um, Beyond, uh, beyond words, really, in uh, where, where we are in a crisis. Our democracy is in a crisis. And in peaceful ways, I think everyone needs to stand up proud and tall to defend our democracy. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Chancellor Clare uh, we've all seen the message that he sent out uh, immediately upon the happening of these events uh, to our college community who I think uh, share uh, our, our, our common feeling of, of uh, despair and uh, having seen what we saw. And, and I do thank you for that, Chancellor Claire. And thank you, uh, Trustee Holliber, for raising this as well. I think we all, we all feel the same way. Any other statements from uh, from trustees? Uh, Trustee uh, Petridis and then Trustee Goodman. I'm all set. What? Thank you. Oh, I saw you unmuted. I'm sorry. Trustee Goodman. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Oliver, for for that statement. Um, I think um, the perfect place for us to have been able to talk about that tonight would have been, um, you know, the agenda item that we have one week and it's not there another week. And I think moving forward, um, we have a template that we want that, you know, that we set uh, and whether it's the item to talk about race, class, gender, and equity, we could have talked about this item and how it affects our students, how we're responding to it at our different sites, but just to give an opportunity to have an open, brief conversation for trustees and the public to be able to ask questions of ourselves. And I think that would have been great. Um, hopefully we can, 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 can continue to um, work on getting those items on the agenda, that there's no pressure on staff to come up with um, talking points other than to just say, hey, this year uh, we have a topic of the day, it's on the agenda, let's talk about how certain items affect our students. Um, you know, whether it's race, class, gender, or equity um, at our, our different sites, and this would have been perfect. Um, another thing is the item uh, on the agenda to allow for um, the represented groups to speak. Um, that, again, also was a part of a template. I know this is a study session, and I'm not sure if that's the, the, the reason. Yes. But, yes. But, but they're still here, and they still may have comments, and they should not be relegated to waiting. Um, to have to uh, speak under, uh, you know, comment from the public, if if that's the pleasure of this, this body to make sure that they that we show them that they do have a place on the agenda uh, to speak and that they are a, a part of this, uh, what we call our, our our district family. That you know, when it comes to speaking, we have uh, items set on there for. Uh, different staff, let's make sure that we have our representative groups um, continue to be a part of the agendas in an intentional manner. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, my, uh, my basic, my statement tonight is to uh, share uh, the fact that um, 
I was very pleased to see on the news last night uh, that um, uh, Sem uh, College of San Mateo uh, Nursing School ha was on TV as our student nurses uh, are acting, are, are prepared to act as volunteers to, to uh, perform uh, COVID uh, uh, vaccines and have stepped up to uh, be part of that program. And I, I hadn't heard anything about that. And, and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that that is something that we are doing and, and that we are uh, taking a, uh, an affirmative effort to uh, help in getting the vaccine out there. And um, that I thought was a, a very good and important thing. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome uh, Cheng uh, to, I, I think this is your first official board meeting, is it not? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's my first board. <laughs> welcome you to our, 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 our board and to our, our community and uh, district family and look forward to your work uh, in the area of uh, human resources and, uh, and all the other areas that you'll be participating with us. Uh, so uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much. No problem. Okay, uh, if there isn't anything further, then uh, our next uh, actual meeting will be January 27th via Zoom. And uh, we will then uh, reconvene now to close session as we have continued business uh, in that venue. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Stay safe, everyone, signing off. Amen. Thank you, everyone.